Yeah, our our speakers, uh, Saidia Khaf is from uh, ETS University. She is PhD student in electrical engineering. Of course, she will introduce herself in more details if she wish to. And the second speaker is Faye Satari. Faye is from Polytechnic Montreal. She is master's student in computer engineering, and she will introduce um, herself as well in more detail if they wish to. So I'm just going to make sure that they can present um, like uh, they have the presentation access. Just give me a second. So, so first I'm giving access to Sadia to um, I'm changing the role to a presenter. So Sadia, I think you are able to to present. I and think after so. word, yes, I'm not sure I can like um, if I make pay. Okay, just hand over. So it's kind of like a handover. So I'm gonna like return to you. And then we can move to to Faye when when we, she wants to like share a screen. Anyway, you are presenter role right now, and I am handing the microphone to please introduce your your events and the agenda, and what will come and what we expecting from this event. And thank you for accepting our invitation. Actually, these two the speakers these are like our active volunteers in our team. It's a great honor to have them like. Uh, as the team member and as the lecturer at the same time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mansoor, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, I would like to welcome all the participants to this exciting event. We are so humbled and overwhelmed by such a large participation. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. In this event, we will start with my friend, Pei. She will be giving you an introduction to Google Colab, which is a wonderful tool. This is like your um, coding in your browser. You don't need to install anything. You don't need to go through, you know, installing the dependencies or anything. You can just go into a browser tab. All you need is a Google account and you can start coding into it. So Faye will be telling you how to do that. She will cover the basics of Google Colab. She will cover how you can use your file system into it. She will cover how you can start writing code different blocks in it. So you will get to know how you can start writing your codes using Python in your browser like a Jupyter notebook. And after that part is covered, I will take over and we will start writing our Q-learning code. They will also introduce you to some gym environments that later I will be using in the second part of the workshop in which we will give you an introduction to OpenAI gym environments. OpenAI is a library of open source environments for reinforcement learning. So we will have an introduction to what kind of environments are there, how we can use them, what kind of functions are there. And after that, we will move on to writing your first Q learning code together with us in your browser. I hope you guys got the uh, template file, a uh, uh, code file, in a GitHub repository. So we will be for the second part of this workshop, we will be using that file and you will be writing the code with us in your browser for both the first and second part. You will open a browser tab and you will write your codes with us so that when you leave this workshop, you will have already completed your first reinforcement learning code in your browser within a couple of hours. So I hope you will learn a lot from this workshop. Without further ado, I will hand over to my friend Faye and she will start giving an introduction to Google Colab to you. Over to you, Pei. Thank you, Sadia, and thank you, Mansoor. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you to joining us. Uh, I'd like to send a very welcome to all of you on behalf of our entire team. Uh, I, um, I hope this workshop would be an interactive workshop and helpful for all of you. Hopefully, it and transfer your knowledge to more professional stage. Uh, before uh, we go further, I'd like to take this opportunity to um, a quick introduction of myself. My name is Faye, and as Mansoor mentioned, I'm a master's student in Polytechnic Montreal University. Uh, I'm a computer engineering student. 
And um, my research area uh, would be um, smart cities, IoT, 5G, and security. Uh, now I'd like to share my browser with you. Okay, let me share. I hope you now see my screen, please. Yeah, we see you, it's okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, as uh, Mansoor and Sadia mentioned in the first section, we are going to talk about uh, Colab and uh, what's the Colab and how we can start coding in, in this nice platform. Uh, I'm prepared uh, these um, documents and these subjects for you. I hope we have enough time to uh, talk about all of them. And uh, uh, I will appreciate if you have any question, put it in the chat uh, and we will uh, uh, answer them if we have enough time again. Okay, let's go and start our um, first part. I'd like to start with uh, a very quick introduction of uh, Colab. What is the Colab? Uh, Colab or collaboratory is an amazing tool provided with Google uh, to um, use their fantastic built-in library, uh, broadly speaking, to uh, online coding in Python. Uh, there are a lot of uh, nice features and facilities in this uh, cloud-based infrastructure. Uh, actually, it's a um, cloud services that gives you um, ability to write and execute your code online on your browser with no need to any installation and setting up on your local machine. And also it brings you a free GPU and TPU, which is a great feature in uh, this platform. I will talk about uh, uh, this part. And uh, there are other uh, stuff like you can easily share your file and other things that uh, we will talk uh, in the next part. Uh, before um, I get started and uh, start uh, create the first notebook, I'd like to ask my colleagues to uh, um, uh, make a pool and I'd like to answer you a question. Uh, uh, I'm just curious to know how many of you uh, now uh, have experience working with Colab and how many of you uh, our experience working with Python. It's very great if you participate in our tool uh, and answer these two questions. Okay, perfect. I think uh, Intikab is just uh, pulling up the polling stuff. So just a second, so he can like, uh, Intikab, I think you, you have access to polling questions. So please pull up if you have them already, like on hands. Okay. Just, uh, I can't see the result, Mansoor. If you help me to find the result, I will appreciate it. Oh, it's, uh, it's not like, uh, it's it's not initiated yet. It's uh, it's uh, it's under preparation right now. So just, okay. uh, just I, I can go further and uh, then- Please move on, please move on. Okay, sure. Uh, uh, how we can create the first notebook? Uh, I assume that uh, you don't know and I just uh, want to share with you. You just need to go uh, in uh, your Google and just search Google Colab. The first link that uh, you can see colab.research.google.com, it uh, redirects you to the main interface of Google Colab, which you have access to this uh, link new notebook if you click on it it's spring you can start uh, creating your code in your notebook another way that is um, interesting and i like to show you is that you can go easily to your uh, drive here and uh, uh, click on new here you have different format of files that you can create. One of them is Google Colab. Uh, just a tricky point here is that 
If you don't see Google Colab here, don't worry, just you need to click on connect more apps. And here you can search for Colab like this. Uh, sorry, Colab. And as you can see, I'm already installed the collaboratory on my uh, browser. But if this is the first time you are going to use, you just need to install it on your browser. And then you have access uh, to this type of files here and you can click on it and create uh, again your notebook file. I want to suggest you start creating your notebook with me and start coding on it and get ready for the next part that you are going to uh, work with Sadia. Uh, it seems that Intehab uh, sent the pool. I will appreciate if you answer these questions. It helps me to uh, uh, manage the content more efficiently for you. Mansoor, uh, I'm waiting for the results. Hey, we still have a couple of minutes left for the participants to answer. So let's see what everybody thinks and how they answer. I think it will be available in a couple of minutes. OK, so I'm going to further uh, let's start talking about different facilities and settings that we have in Colab. I'd like to start with uh, how we can change the name of your file. Uh, you can uh, put your name of your file here or change it. For example, I like to change the name of my file. So simple and just you need to save it, just as. Uh, another thing that we have, we have a um, setting here. For example, you can change the um, theme of uh, uh, your browser to dark mode if you like. Or uh, let's back to the light mode. Or there are some stuff here to uh, setting up the uh, font size and other stuff in your uh, browser for uh, beautifulness and easiest way to work with. Uh, there, there is a funny uh, uh, setting here. I like to show it. Uh, I set it in many power and save it. Then I start typing. And as you can see, it's a just funny setting that you can enjoy it and uh, don't get bored of this um, coding uh, platform. Uh, let's back to the normal state. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, you can create table of content for your uh, documentation and your code here. Just you need to add a section, something like this, and uh, then you can put a name here, anything, test section, for example. And as you can see, it will add it to your uh, table of content, you can uh, move on and uh, access to uh, the section. You can search and replace like as other uh, browser, other uh, document um, platforms. And also, okay, I will back to code snippets in the next part. Uh, we have a place for your files and working, um, putting any file that you like to work. Uh, let's try to, for example, I like to add a picture. Okay, it brings you an alert that this place is a temporary uh, for your file, which means if you close, uh, close your browser, if uh, you 
your session will be ended then you will uh, lose your file and your file will uh, will gone uh, so uh, we need to um, have a permanent uh, place for your file we will uh, talk about it but before that i like to um, mention about gpu and tpu as i mentioned uh, which uh, these two features are uh, the important and um, a nice feature in Google Collab. Um, I, in my point of view, uh, the most important feature that uh, distinguished Collab from uh, other uh, cloud-based services uh, is that you have uh, free access to GPU and TPU. How you can use them? You just need to go to Edit and then to go go to Notebook setting here you can change the hardware accelerator to gpu or tpu as you can see uh, but uh, what's the gpu and what's the tpu uh, before i um, talk about the uh, these two i like to show you an example uh, i don't wanna uh, talk about the um, whole code that we have here i just okay before um, I, I probably give a error message because I didn't change the GPU and CPU as my hardware accelerator. Uh, this code provides two array, a random array for of images and start uh, manipulating these images in two different modes, CPU mode and GPU mode. And uh, it's, uh, it's going to uh, compare uh, the result of these two uh, different modes uh, for uh, considering the time of uh, processing. Uh, as you can see here, uh, with CPU, it takes around um, uh, uh, three seconds, but with GPU, it takes around uh, 0.04 seconds, which means GPU is faster than CPU uh, around uh, 76 times, which is very great when you are going to work with a, um, images, videos, and uh, you have a complicated algorithm and you need to have a um, better uh, and faster solution uh, for your algorithm. Okay, I can see the result of the pool now. Uh, so it seems that you guys have uh, already experienced working with Python, nice. Uh, so it's make it easy this presentation and I'm glad that see some of you have experience with collab it's so nice I hope I hope you don't get bored of my presentation and for those that don't have any experience with collab and uh, Python don't worry because uh, if you know any other language the syntax of Python is very simple and you don't have a big trouble to deal with uh, this language uh, you can see uh, in next minutes. Okay, back to uh, my presentation. And hey, thank you. Jay, sorry for interrupt. I wonder if you can like a bit increase the font size because I see the same situation here. Like, um, can you please increase the font so, size sure. of the browser? Sure, I will do it. Thank you for your notice. Is it better now? Yeah, yeah, it's it's much better, much better. Okay, thank you for um, the, give this hint to me. Okay, uh, GPU or a graphic processing unit and TPU, uh, which stand for a tensor uh, processing unit, uh, are uh, two features that uh, gives you hard uh, different hardware accelerator for processing your uh, algorithms and codes. The main difference between uh, GPU and CPU is that CPU is uh, mainly um, uh, designed to handle a, um, a wide range of tasks uh, um, in considering the CPU time. And uh, um, it has some limited to work with uh, concurrency tasks. Instead, GPU 
is designed to um, quickly render huge images and videos concurrently. Uh, also, uh, about the TPU, uh, I'd like to mention that TPU is uh, um, an application-specific integration circuit to accelerate the uh, AI calculation and algorithms, which uh, provided with Google for the first time. They uh, developed it especially for neural network machine learning, uh, uh, for TensorFlow software, and they started, I mean, Google started using of um, a TPU in 2015, then they made it public in 2018, and now here we go, we have free access to TPU in your collab, in your browser, with no need to installation. If you are going to use TensorFlow project, it's a very nice feature, I really suggest you try it. Uh, I want to talk about different kind of cells that we have. We have uh, two types of cell, uh, code cell and text cell. As you can see uh, here, uh, what we have until now, all of these created by a uh, text cell. So it means that you can uh, put images, text, headings, uh, bullet lists, uh, and other stuff. Uh, as you can see in a text cell, I'd like to sh show you the edit mode of a text cell. For example, you can simply uh, Google, add a link like this, just you need to add the URL, google.com, and if you click on it, now you have uh, your link, or you can add the image, and one nice feature in uh, Google Collab is that you can write uh, any uh, formula, any um, equation, like as uh, what you can do with LaTeX here, just you need to put your full formula between two uh, dollar signs. For example, I like to say something like this. You can see the result uh, real time in the right side. Okay. And uh, if you double click on it, you go to view mode. If again, double click on it, you go to edit mode. It's so simple. Uh, I don't want to uh, put a lot of time in this part. Uh, let's go to the next part. Uh, as I mentioned, you have a very easy way to share uh, your notebook with other people, like as uh, other services in Google. You just need to click on share and then choose an, any person that you like with uh, uh, his or her email then you can choose a three kind of a permission as a viewer or a commenter or editor and just send uh, the invitation for share uh, this notebook with this. Or you can use uh, the um, specific link. Again, you have, um, for example, um, oh, sorry. Uh, you can uh, choose, uh, these two types of uh, uh, creating the link, and you can put the um, uh, permission for your link again, which is a nice feature. And for example, you can create a link with viewer mode and put it in your website, web blog, any place that you like. It's, it's so simple to working with your colleague or your with, uh, teammate in uh, one uh, notebook. If you guys uh, uh, are uh, um, used to working on GitHub, you can save your uh, collab notebook, your notebook a version in GitHub like this. Just you need to click on GitHub and then log into your GitHub. Okay. Then you should uh, choose a repository or a branch and a branch. I like to create a new repository. Uh, just let me name it, for example, IEEE Workshop. And I add the readme file. It's default, it creates a main branch automatically. Then if I back to my collab, let's 
cancel it. They again go to save a, a copy in GitHub. I can choose, okay, I don't know why it don't come here. Maybe I made a mistake. Okay, I choose another uh, branch, okay, like this, and I save it here. It gives you your notebook, copy a notebook in uh, your GitHub, and then you have access to open it in uh, your collab directly from your GitHub, which is a nice feature. That's back here. Also, you can uh, uh, download two types of version, Python version and IPython net notebook version, which you can uh, bring your file to any idea that you like. Uh, another thing that I like to show you is that, as I mentioned, you can work with your file as an input or as a um, saving your result with this content place, but uh, it's a temporary place. So if you need a permanent place for uh, working with your file, there is an option here that you can, uh, you can mount uh, your Google Drive in your collab. Just click on this part. As you can see, uh, it uh, adds a, a very small piece of code here. If you run this code, it brings you a link. Uh, and if the, you click on this link, so you must choose your uh, account and then add uh, allow the permissions that needs. Here you uh, will see a link, just you need to copy this link and back here, paste it here and press enter. What will happen is that you will see a drive in the uh, left side, as you can see. If you go to this uh, path, you will, you can see all folders and files that you have in your Google Drive. You can create a specific folder for uh, working with your notebook and put your file there or uh, retrieve any file that you like from uh, your Google Drive. I will back to this part uh, in the next uh, part. And the final thing that I like mention is that there is a um, revision history in your collab notebook which means you have option to uh, compare a uh, previous version with, with current version and find what's happened in a uh, different version in your collab for um, history of uh, changes in your notebook. Uh, let's say and talk about the code cell. As I mentioned, we have two type of cell, text cell and code cell. Uh, this is a code cell. Uh, I want to add another code cell here and start with very classic uh, hello world. Okay, for running your code, you just need to uh, click on this button and the result will be appeared here. You, ha you can clean up the result. Again, you can run it. There are other uh, options uh, with keyboard that you can run your uh, cell code. I mentioned uh, here, you can see. Uh, any um, uh, cell code have, uh, and even any uh, text code have uh, some uh, settings and tools uh, here. Um, for example, you can move up or move down your uh, uh, cell with these two button, access to direct link for any cell that you like. Uh, the same setting that you see in the top, you have uh, beside of any code cell. And you can delete it, copy, cut, and other stuff that you can see here. Uh, another feature, nice feature that I like to mention is that you can uh, put uh, some uh, note beside of any cell that you like. This is a test. And if you uh, put this comment 
And if you work with, uh, for example, uh, anyone else in one notebook, uh, you can communicate uh, in one cell with your colleague or your teammate. For example, this is a test again. Uh, finally, if the problem is solved, you can resolve your comments. What happened is that uh, these comments and uh, the history will be go to this comment. You can see the history of your comments and uh, replies and other stuff here. You can reopen it, which it brings it back, or again, you can resolve it. It's very nice feature if you working with uh, other people in one notebook to communicate and uh, make some um, comment for other people in a notebook, or even uh, put reminder for yourself. It's very nice feature. Uh, as I mentioned, you don't need to install any um, packages or libraries like as other ID uh, when you are working with Colab, which means you already access to all the uh, famous libraries such as uh, Pandas, uh, NumPy's, uh, um, I don't know, um, uh, TensorFlow, all of these uh, libraries uh, are available in um, Colab uh, built-in and you don't need to install anything, just import library that you like. Sorry, I want to import, for example, NumPy. Uh, here we go, we don't need to install and we can use this library without any installation. For example, I like to see the version of my NumPy sorry, uh, version with this command. You can see that NumPy is already uh, built in, installed in your Colab, and you can use it with no need to installation. Uh, other uh, libraries, as I mentioned, like as um, Panda, SciPy, or TensorFlow are the same, and you can use them. I just want to mention that uh, we have different types of um, li packages and libraries. For example, we have NumPy and SciPy and Panda for uh, uh, science programming, for, and NumPy more specifically is uh, useful for working with multi-dimensional uh, arrays and metrics, or uh, we have some uh, packages for um, specifically for machine learning uh, programming, like as Scikit-Learn, TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch, and other libraries. And we have also um, Pygame or uh, some libraries for reinforcement learning and gaming programming, which we are going to work with in the next part, specifically uh, with Sadia. So uh, uh, most of these libraries are exist in uh, your Colab notebook. If you want to know uh, which libraries uh, already exist and you have access, you just need to use this very simple uh, command, just this. With this command, you can see the all library that you have access here with the version. For example, you can see we have the TensorFlow and the version is Two one uh, two four point four point one. Uh, I like to bring you another nice uh, uh, command. For example, I like to import uh, pandas, but I don't have any idea about pandas. Don't worry. You just need to give a, a directory from pandas with this very simple command. And if you run this, okay, now you have access to all uh, methods and functions inside the pandas. You, you see it's so easy working uh, with uh, Python with this uh, simple uh, command. 
Now, if you want to know about any of this function and uh, have more information, you can go with this. For example, I like to, I don't know. Um, um, for example, I want to know about uh, evil. I don't know what is this. You just need to add a question mark at the end of uh, your function. And then if you run your code, okay, here you will see uh, the signature, the input parameters, output or return value, and even it brings you some example, coding example, which is nice, and you can easily find how work with functions and how they work for you. There is another way you can use this command help. It's the same with uh, the previous command. Let me go a little, okay, now it's better. It's the same with the previous uh, command and you have the same information here uh, and you can use them. I think you already know that if you uh, hover your mouse in uh, each function or package, you will have a very quick access to uh, some useful detail like this. And it's another way to access information if you like in a uh, collab. Okay, uh, let's go to the next part. I, I think we don't have time to more talking about this part. Okay, some uh, libraries and packages it is not exist in uh, collab. You need to install them. For install, you just need to use this very simple uh, uh, command, pip install package name or apt-get install package name. The, um, both of them uh, are the same. The difference between them is that pip is a uh, use of a um, repository of Python for installing the pa package, get apt-get, use of repository of Ubuntu for uh, installing the package and go there and download the, uh, the package. I bring here a link for you. You can go there and uh, find more information about apt-get and other options and parameters that you can use with apt-get. Uh, I recommend you go and find uh, the same thing for pip because we have the same thing uh, for pip. For example, if I want to install uh, this specific uh, uh, package in my Python, I just uh, use the exclamation mark pip install and uh, matplotlib, the name of package. If I run this, uh, because I uh, installed it, it says already installed, but if I, uh, it doesn't exist, it's a start to installation. Or for example, here I have another uh, installation with apt-get, which is a start to installation. For example, I use the dash y, which means uh, any confirmation during the installation uh, will automatically say it by yes and confirm. You don't need to install. After installing a package, if you want to know and ensure that your package is installed uh, very well and perfect, you just need to um, use this uh, simple um, um, command. Pip show the name of your package, brings you the name of package, the version, uh, the path that it's already installed and other information, which means you have access to this package right now in your browser. Uh, I talk about the show. I don't wanna um, uh, run these codes, but uh, you, um, it's good that you know we can upgrade our package with uh, this, uh, simple uh, command, pip install, double dash upgrade, the name of package, and you can change the version of a package in your browser uh, with uh, this command, pip install, the name of your package, and the number of version that you like. You can change the version. I want to go to the next part and start 
uh, plotting uh, some charts fit together and uh, I've seen that you answer to uh, our poll about uh, which uh, favorite tools that you used before for providing charts. Uh, I'm not sure about the result, but uh, I want to um, share with you Python is uh, they have a very powerful packages for plotting. Uh, when you using with uh, high val volume data and when you uh, want to bring some statistic reports, it's a necessary thing that you put some chart and diagram in your um, report if you want to be professional. So uh, I like to share uh, with you how you can plot some chart and diagram based on your data in uh, um, collab with Python. We have different packages uh, such as Buke or Seaborn uh, or other packages for uh, creating a diagram, but I like to go with one of the famous and powerful one, which is Matplotly. Let's go and start uh, creating some uh, sample data for our plotting. I like to use uh, NumPy. I just go with Again, import, import, numpy. And then I like to define some array. The first one, six in range, one to 12. Uh, let me print the result to show you what is doing. Okay, I create an array with a integer between 1 to 11, not including the 11. This is a way that you can create an array in um, Python. Uh, I like to use another way. For example, this time I go with NumPy and create random numbers with random and uh, specifically I want to use a rand in to create random integers. So I want to start with uh, one and um, I, the la latest number that I like to see, for example, it's eight and the size of my array that I like, it's 10, something like this. And if this time I uh, print Greg, you can see the difference between two commands. Okay, as you can see, the first one uh, create an array with 10 items, uh, which they are uh, one, two, three, uh, or ordinary, ordinary numbers. But this uh, um, command uh, provide an array with 10 items, but uh, it's a random int integer between 1 and 8, as uh, you can see here. Let me just uh, very quickly create two other. Uh, this one would be x2, and this one would be y2. For example, 6, and for example, 9. These are just sample. Okay, I create four uh, array with uh, 10 items for each array. Now I'm going to plot uh, some uh, charts uh, based on these data that I have. For plotting uh, charts, uh, first of all, you need to import Matplotlib. And uh, specifically, I like to use uh, PyPlot. So, uh, as I mentioned, for plotting, you just need to use a very simple command, which is plot. And put your data. I like to use of x1 and y1 for my data. And after that, you should uh, show your plot, which is the simple command, which is show. Let's see the result. Here we go. We just create the first plot together, very simple. I like to uh, 
create another uh, chart, but uh, at the same, uh, I mean, I like to create another line based on, for example, x1, y2 in the same chart. I just need to another plot and then you can see here the result. You can easily plot uh, any data that you have in one chart. It's so simple. Uh, you can add, for example, title for your chart to make it more professional with this command. Uh, for example, first chart, I name it first chart. Here we go, we have it here, or you can uh, label uh, the X and Y axis by this very simple command, plt.xlabel, and name it X value. Sorry, okay. And the same thing we have for Y label. Uh, this time I like to put a formula. As I mentioned, you can write formula here. I like to say this is X equal Y. See the result. You have a formula here. You have a label for your uh, X. Uh, another nice thing that you can do is that you can use the grid to make your uh, diagram uh, like a mesh and grid. Also, I like to use plt dot uh, 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 and give it x1. What is uh, going to do is that it brings this uh, exact measurement based of your x value in your x axis. You can do the same thing for y axis. Uh, uh, but I don't want to do that. Another thing that we need uh, for our chart is um, legend. I like to label uh, this one first line or line one. And this one line two. line two and then if you add this command legend what's happening here is that oh maybe i okay i made a mistake here okay it's a nice thing if you uh, have any problem in your code you can see the error like this in the uh, your uh, output part uh, I made a mistake in my uh, syntax and uh, okay. Now you have the legend here. Another thing that you can do uh, with your plot is that you can filter that uh, use of uh, this figure function to resize your chart. It, it has a parameter which is fixed size and it takes height and uh, width, for example, uh, six and eight, something like this. Let's see, okay, maybe I change it. It's better to change it, for example, eight and six. Now you can see you have a bigger chart. Also, you can uh, give some style, for example, line width to your, uh, uh, lines or you can give a style line a style a style to your uh, oh, I made a mistake line a style to your uh, charts you can see here or you can add marker for your chart uh, for your line marker I like to go with O. Can you see it's add some marker for your points? 
and you even can change the size of marker size, marker size, uh, and make it, for example, 10. You can see the uh, how you can uh, set some beautiful uh, style, or even you can marker uh, face color. You can change the color of marker. I like to go with, sorry, light blue to make it more beauty. Uh, okay, I made a mistake here. Uh, let's say marker face. Okay, face. Oh, sorry. Color. Okay, uh, so you can do very uh, simple things to create a very beautiful uh, line. I like to add the same thing for the next. Just let's remove this. And even you can uh, set the um, color, color for your line. I like to add red and change the color for the uh, second line. Okay, we have a very uh, beautiful chart with very simple um, commands. You have the same uh, style you can add for title and uh, your labels. Uh, another thing that I like to mention is that you can save your uh, uh, chart as a uh, PNG file with this uh, function, for example, name it pig1 and let's save it. What will happen is that if you go to this place, okay, you have it here and you can uh, download it in your computer and use it any place that you like. Uh, we have other uh, types of charts. For example, we have bar charts. Let's look at the bar chart with X1 and Y1 and plt.show. Okay, here we go. We can uh, do the same thing and put another x2, y2 here. You can see we, we can add all of these things that we put in the previous uh, plot here. And now we, you have another beautiful plot like this. If you can see you don't have a legend here, you should label it. Uh, and let's label it bar one and label bar two. Now we have this. Or another type that maybe it's interesting to talk a scatter. It's another type for a preparing some beautiful charts. It's uh, X1, Y1. Now you have a, a diagram like this. Okay, there are a lot of beautiful uh, charts and diagrams and assigning them. We don't have time to go with them. I like to um, show you uh, some samples in code snippet. We have code snippet here. You can search, for example, visualization. Okay. If you see here, there are beautiful and very professional samples. You can use them and uh, give some idea from them. I like to test one of them. I don't know what is this. I just insert the code uh, inside of my uh, notebook. And if I run this code, what will happen is that here we go. We have a very beautiful chart. It's an uh, uh, interactive chart with uh, changing your voice. It, it moves and you have options to save and other options. You can, you can uh, find other uh, nice samples here and use them to take some idea, to uh, find some idea and use them in your work. Let's move on and uh, I prepare um, some sample here. Uh, 
uh, let's say we are going to uh, uh, calculate uh, let equal x2 plus y2 uh, I prepare some um, array with uh, 40 items to array A and B and then use uh, those two array with mesh grid to uh, create a um, two dimension array like this. So I now I have X and Y two different array, two dimension array. Uh, and then use them to calculate the Z based on my formula like this. Okay, let's print the Z. Maybe it's not bad to print the Z. Here we go. Now I'm trying to plot the Z based on X and Y. As you can see, it would be a tree plot. I write the code here because we don't have time. I just run the code. And this is the result, which I use again the uh, matplotlib. I uh, put the size for my um, uh, diag uh, charts and then uh, set the two dimension as my axis, use the plot surface, uh, surface a uh, nice uh, function and uh, set the x, y and z as my parameter and this is just the um, style of uh, my color map and also I use the contour to create a contour for uh, my uh, z uh, dimension you can change it and I set the offset zero to uh, create uh, my uh, contour in the zero point of my uh, options and again it's a let's I change it to see you what's happened I like go I don't know what are these I just check another one for example this okay it's just a um, color map different color map that we have in uh, um, python and you can use them for your uh, chart and another thing is that you can create a color bar like this with a very simple uh, command uh, okay all uh, things about the charts i think we need to go to next part pickling uh, if you uh, want to work uh, with uh, files, uh, especially if you have dictionaries and um, some objects that you like to save it in a file, it's a good option that you use of pickling. Uh, um, it's so simple working with pickling. Let's do it together. Uh, first, I like to create an object, for example, my object, OBG, and uh, my object would be content uh, include x and y and then z okay i create just an object based on uh, the arrays that i have now i like to import pickle okay it's a nice way to working with file then you uh, need to create a file. Let's uh, name it file out. And then with uh, command open, you can open a file with any name. Let's uh, go with file test, something like this, dot pickle. And, pickle. and then, as I said, I want to write in this file, so you need to pass the parameter W for writing and B for uh, byte stream because I want to uh, write a um, byte stream in my file. Then uh, the things that you should to do is that use of pickle and use of uh, this function dump. Then put your object, which is my object and your file which is for example file out and finally you should to close your file okay let's run this code okay 
what happened is that now you have your file here. If you click on it, you can see the result here. Uh, it's, it doesn't make sense, make sense because it's a binary file, but we can retrieve it in our code again by, by very simple uh, code. Let's say file in this time. I name it file in and then again, I like to open my file. Which file? The same file that I created, this file. And this time I want to read my file. So I uh, put the write as my input and again binary type. And then you should to load your uh, file with uh, this simple uh, command, pickle, okay, dot uh, load and put your file in, uh, your file as a parameter there. I like to save it in a variable. Uh, let's name it temp variable. And for showing to uh, the result, I like to print it. Okay. Now we start reading our file put it in file and load it in a temp variable and use it for print. You can use it in uh, other uh, codes, part of code. It's so simple working with uh, pickle files. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this place is temporary. So if uh, we want to work with our drive, what should we do? Let's go with together and see what we can do to saving a pickle file in uh, your Google Drive. Let's uh, try with the same code that we create this file, but this time I go to drive, my drive. Let's say I'm going to save my file in uh, this folder. Just, I need to copy the path and paste it here and add a one backslash, okay. Now, if I'm running this code, what's happened is that if you go to your drive and open this path, you will see that now you have, uh, what is the name? File test here. You have the file test. Let's change the name. Let's name it in drive and again run it. And I want to refresh it. Now you have file test drive here. It's so simple. You just need to uh, click on it and copy the path. Again, you are able to um, read file from your Google Drive with the same structure like this. I like to copy this. Let me go with this file and change the name, for example, one, 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 one. Okay, here we go. Again, we read the file from our Google Drive. It's so simple. Also, you have option to uh, save your file with a very um, simple um, code, which is, um, I like to, um, share something with you uh, from google.colab. You just need to collab, you just need to import files. Okay, then you can use the files and download and just put any address, any path that you have. Let's go with uh, the file that we have in our Google Drive. If I run this file, what's happened? Okay, mm, files, that's me. That, yeah, I made a mistake, I guess. Okay, uh, it brings you this feature that you can save your file in your device. You can uh, do the same thing with the um, file that you have in your content. For example, if you like, you can save it. This file, not different. 
Again, you are able to save your file from this place. You just need to give this permission to your browser and then save your file here. Okay, uh, for the um, next part, I like to talk about some libraries that you need to install for working OpenAI uh, Gym uh, Toolkit. Uh, we have some uh, um, uh, pre-requisition, um, pre pre-packages um, uh, uh, for working with Gym Toolkit. One of them is um, X uh, libraries, which are uh, actually um, a server that can run on your machine with no display uh, hardware. So I want to install this package in my uh, machine. I guess you will do the same thing with Sadia. Then uh, you should uh, to install a um, Pi virtual display, which is um, a um, wrapper to connect your uh, browser to X server and then Finally, you need to install Gym Toolkit in your browser. Uh, I don't want to talk about these codes because you will uh, practice them with Sadia. I just want to show you the result. It's just a preparation for the next part. As you can see here, you will coding with Sadia and providing something nice it is a, um, actually a cardful environment and it's an agent-based um, coding which uh, choose an agent uh, from a, a random agent from a possible uh, existing agent and provide this uh, interactive um, environment. There are a lot of other environment. I just bring uh, some one, just one uh, other example, it needs a very specific dependencies uh, in uh, gym, tool, gym package. I installed this and then if we run this code, we will see some results like this. Again, it's another um, agent-based environment, which is mostly for uh, physics problems. And there are a lot of beautiful samples in a uh, gym toolkit. You can go and find them and enjoy them. Uh, I don't know if we have time. Uh, I like to show very quickly uh, this uh, two feature. You can create uh, forms in your collab. Uh, just you need to add a code cell and then go to insert and add a form field. You have different types of uh, form field and for each of them you have uh, different uh, types. I add for example uh, a string and drop down and uh, you can see the results here. If someone choose uh, some of them then you have access to the results in your uh, rest of your code something like this. It's very nice. You can create a very interactive um, uh, form in your uh, coding here with Colab. And another nice feature is that you have a lot of uh, facilities working with tables. Uh, just you need to import the data table. Uh, don't worry about this, it's just a, a sample set. Uh, I just use for showing a data to you. As you can see, you can create a beautiful table, table with uh, sorting ability and filtering and other uh, uh, beautiful uh, capabilities that you see. Thank you for your attention. Sorry, it takes a little more uh, than one hour. I think you are uh, need to some rest. Uh, I want to um, say again thank you for your attention and invite you to take a break and then back uh, to me and Sadia and um, join to Sadia um, for the rest of this uh, presentation. Mansoor, uh, thank you. Thank you, Faye. Um, it was a great presentation. So is there any question that we can answer right now? 
Okay, let me check if there is any question. Yeah, sure. I'm available for any question. If I can, I will. Okay, just a second to see if we have a... Um... I think we have a question about x checks for Faye. Someone asked, what's the purpose of using x checks in the plot? Excuse me. Uh, yeah, uh -huh, it's about the x ticks, like a ticks of the x okay. axis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As I mentioned, okay, let's sh let's show again back here. Okay, without x ticks, uh, if you run your diagram, uh, the s steps that you can see here, uh, it's by default uh, with uh, two s steps side. But uh, in my X, if we back to our X, it was been with one step slice. If I uh, have to bring all the data for my X here, that's, so you need to use our X ticks and set the value that you like, or even you can set another value. For example, your X uh, has 1 million data, but you don't want to uh, see all of this as your measurement in, the, in your X axis. You just can bring a, a value for your X ticks to show uh, with what measure you like to uh, create differentiation in your X axis. I hope uh, I answered your question. Yes, uh, okay. thank you, Faye. I see one last question is about uh, how could we do all this? I'm not sure I could understand this question, but let me read it for you. How could we do all this with just Python and not Google? I'm not sure what does it mean, but uh, if it's Actually, like understandable for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, um, as I man, my understanding, uh, these codes that I write here, all of these are based on Python. So no, no difference about the ID. You can do it in any ID that you like, for example, Jupyter Notebook or uh, even VS Code, any platform that you like. These are the Python code, no difference. But the only thing that we have here is uh, the um, uh, GPU and TPU that, uh, as I mentioned, it's very nice. And also we have some feature like as you can add the interactive forms, interactive um, text documents, beside of your code and prepare a very nice code beside of your document, share it with your colleagues. These are the features that we use Colab in your browser and you don't need to any installation for packages and uh, add any other things in your local machine. So we choose Colab as our ID, just this, no different uh, for these uh, comments, uh, comments you can run it in other uh, IDs as well. I okay, hope perfect. I answered I your think, question. Uh, I think we can take a very quick break. Uh, Sadia, would you like to take a quick break? Yeah, I think our attendees have a lot to process right now. So we can take like a 10 minutes break and then we can come back. All right, so I think uh, we are ready to move on to the second part of the workshop. I will start with a little introduction about myself. My name is Sadia Khaf. I'm a PhD student at ETS Montreal. I started my PhD about a year ago. Before that, I was a lecturer at Kulami Khan Institute of Engineering Sciences and Technology. I taught there for a year at the Department of Electrical Engineering as a lecturer. I was teaching third year and fourth year electrical engineering students. My teaching was mainly related to communication systems and digital control systems. I developed my interest in machine learning during my master's and also during my teaching and my research work at the Faculty of Electrical Engineering. So I decided to pursue my PhD in machine learning. Currently, my research is focused on using reinforcement learning for wireless communications and cognitive radio networks. So I'm basically trying to improve connectivity and provide better internet using reinforcement learning. I taught myself reinforcement learning, as I mentioned in my uh, sort of introductory video on my YouTube channel about this workshop, that the best way to learn reinforcement learning or the best way to get your hands dirty or start writing your code is not really to take a course 
in reinforcement learning. That's the long way. That's the way if you want to do a PhD in machine learning, then yes, that's the right way. You you take one course, you take another course, then you take another course, which is what I did. And that's how I taught myself reinforcement learning. And I started writing my basic codes. But if you want to get started right away, if you want to dive in from day one, you want to write your code, which is which has been my approach with most of the codes that I've written in my life. I didn't know Python until a year ago. So the way I started learning Python was by giving myself a problem, which I have already done in some other language, maybe like MATLAB. MATLAB has been my favorite language so far. And then diving right, right away into writing the code in Python. Whatever I need to do, I just Google it. What this does is it, it develops your habits towards learning. It teaches you what's the best way to learn something because the process is always the same. Whenever you're working on a new problem, the problem might be different. I might be learning Python right now. I might need to learn some other software tomorrow, but this process is easy to remember, especially if you have a bad memory like me. This process becomes part of your muscle memory and you sort of know that, OK, I will start dive, start writing the code right away. And whenever I run into a problem, whenever I need to do something, I will just Google it. It becomes part of your habit. So that's what you should be doing if you want to learn something quick. If you want to learn any programming language quick, if you want to learn Q learning, uh, deep learning, any kind of new thing that you're trying to get into, get your hands dirty get yourself into doing it right away because in the beginning, yes, you you will have a lot of questions. You won't know um, what reinforcement learning is or how to do something or you won't even maybe know how to plot. A line or how to generate a sequence of random numbers, which you have been doing maybe a lot in another language. So you will just Google it. So that's what we're going to do today. In this workshop, we're going to start by diving into it right away. I hope you all have the file that I shared with you. If, if you don't have it, please let me know. This is a GitHub repository. Also, let me know if you have any previous experience with reinforcement learning. I'm not sure if you've ever written any Q learning code before or if you conceptually know what's the difference between supervised, unsupervised and reinforcement learning. So we have created this poll for you. Uh, this workshop is going to be very interactive. So get your copies. I have mine uh, and we're going to take our copies. We're going to write our codes together and we're going to have some question answers while we're doing it. So I need your answers to this poll uh, right now. Can you tell how to open the file in Colab? Well, you will have a link which will tell you how to open this file in Colab. Can you all just go to this repository? Do you all have access to this repository? If you don't have it, I'm going to put it in the chat right away anyway, so that everyone can open it with me. And then we can take it from there. So this is the file. Uh, don't try to run it because it's incomplete. It will run into some errors. Just clone this repository or copy this, this repository somewhere and the way you can do that is by going there. You can go to code and if you've done this sort of thing before, you can just clone it locally or you can open it in uh, Colab as well. So I would recommend opening it right away in Colab. To open it in Colab, this is just the readme. You won't find it here. You will go to the first file, which is called IEEE hands-on RL. If you go to that file, you will find a link which gives you open in Colab option. So I would say, head over there, uh, click that link, open it, maybe make a copy in your Google Drive so that you can work in one file and you have another file for another time if you want to practice again. So you have that original file intact or you can always come back to GitHub and you can get that file again. But I think we might we might be updating that file together. So before we start writing our codes, please let me know in this poll do you have any previous experience with reinforcement learning? Any any sort of experience? Do you know what it is? Have you written a reinforcement learning code before? Do you have even a little experience with it? So based on that, I will keep the pace of the workshop like that. If you all know about reinforcement learning, if you all have written a little bit, we'll go a bit faster. But if it's the first time uh, you're trying to learn reinforcement learning, we'll go a little bit slow and I will answer your questions along the way as we go. So please head over to the poll. 
I would encourage all of you to participate in it. Please answer this question so that this workshop becomes more and more specific to your needs. Because we're all here to learn, right? So in the meantime, I'm going to open this in Colab. Yes, this is the exact file that I have in my other tab, so I will go back and show you again. This is the GitHub repository. Please let me know if the font size and everything is OK. OK. No experience I want to learn. Very good. I'm very glad to hear that. That's amazing. Know some concepts, but didn't code by myself. I, I'm expecting that would be the majority of people uh, who have sort of heard about reinforcement learning, that it's the next cool thing in machine learning tool, but haven't coded yet. That that was me one year ago. I heard a lot about reinforcement learning. I even took a theoretical course in reinforcement learning, which te teaches you all the math behind it, which tells you what are Markov decision processes, tells you why reinforcement learning works in the first first place. So in the theoretical courses, you learn about convergence, you know why it works, you know what are the Bellman equations, how, are, how do the Bellman updates work. So if you're into that sort of thing, I would recommend taking some theoretical reinforcement learning course if you want to know the math behind it. But even after taking the whole course, I had no idea how to code it. I knew what policy iteration is, what value iteration is, but I needed to start coding it to actually know. Okay, I ha we have the poll results now, and I think most people fall into the category of no. So, all, all right, so we'll go a little bit slower, and if we cannot finish everything in this workshop, we can always come back for another. We can always arrange another one. So let me know always throughout this workshop if I'm going faster because I want you to actually code everything with me. So if it becomes too fast, you can always slow me down. You can always let me know. I'll keep an eye on the chat. Can you please also recommend a course for maths behind reinforcement learning? Yes, any theoretical course um, on reinforcement learning would do. Just search MDPs, Markov decision processes, Bellman equations, it will take you, for example, you can take any course in, I would say start with stochastic processes that might be necessary for some aspects of reinforcement learning. Then you can take any course in decision theory. So if, if you go to that, if you learn about Markov decision processes, uh, you will start having a theoretical background of reinforcement learning. So uh, have you all, uh, opened this file into your Google Colabs and made a copy of it. Once you've done that, please let me know in the chat and we will start uh, implementing the code. This file, this is the file that you should be seeing. Okay, yes, you opened the file. All right, very good. Once you've opened the files, please make a copy for your own self so that you have it for later and let's work on a separate copy so that you know uh, if you need to go back to something, you can always go back to it. The first block is setting up the environment with everything we need. So we are basically just installing OpenAI Gem. We are installing a private display. There was a question in the previous section about uh, private installing the private display. So this step is only for Google Colab. You don't need to do it if you're working on your local machine. For example, if you're working in Visual Studio Code, or if you're working in your local Jupyter Notebook, then you already have your computer screen, which is capable of opening separate windows. For example, if, if your graph is a moving object, then your, your computer can open a separate window to render that OpenAI gem environment, and it, it can show you a video of the environment. But when you're working in Google Colab, we don't have that kind of separate screen which can pop out automatically and show us that video of sequence of events that are happening in the environment. So that's why we install something called a private virtual display. And these are the relevant libraries for that. Font, okay, I will make it bigger. 
please let me know if you can see it properly now. If it's still small, uh, let me know. And I will actually make it bigger for the Facebook audience as well here. I hope it's bigger without cutting. Okay, perfect, perfect. So this is something you don't have to copy. You already have it in your file that you received. So just run the first cell. Once you run it, it should install the libraries needed for opening a secondary display. Someone said you cannot hear. Is it just a one person problem or is everyone having trouble hearing? I think I can advise the people, please, um, if you have voice problem in your menu options in your setting, please move to audio and video setting. And all you need is just to configure your audio setting. So you may need to dial over the like uh, voice over IP if you have a problem. But I don't see this is a like a server problem or from your side. So I think uh, you can easily manipulate in your setting. Okay, so I think most people are fine with it. It might be an individual case, so let's move on. Let me know if you were able to successfully install these libraries in your file. Head over to your files, run this cell, and let me know if you didn't run into an error. As long as you didn't get anything red in the results, we're fine. Okay, so I see for one person, it's successful. I would encourage everybody else to also go and install these libraries and let me know if they are installed correctly. For most part, these libraries, these codes, they will be copy paste thing for you. Once you get used to it, once you know the name of the library, you can always just paste it. You don't need details. Where should be installed? Well, uh, you will, yeah, in the same copy, you can, you have two copies, one copy that you made for later if you want to see something and the second copy which is the second file, which is for working now. So you can use one of these for later, whichever file you want, it's your choice. So pick one file to work for now and one for later. So the one you picked for now, just go in there and run the first cell and let me know if it ran without any error. So I see that now a lot of people said that it installed correctly, which is good thing, that's your first step. Now you know how to install a secondary private virtual display for displaying the gym environment. The second thing is we now need to import some libraries. These libraries are entirely, entirely, entirely your choice. I would not restrict you to NumPy or TensorFlow or PyTorch. There is a lot of debate. What's the best reinforcement learning library for beginners or to get started? Is it TensorFlow, is it PyTorch, is it NumPy, Keras, Pandas, what kind of libraries we need. So for beginners, the ones like me who didn't know Python, I would say don't use any library. Start with vanilla NumPy. You can use just Python, you can use NumPy, you can use PyTorch, you can use TensorFlow. OpenAI Gym is written in a NumPy base. So it should technically work with any library that you want to use because most of them they are written in numpy base or they are compatible with numpy bases so if you want if you're comfortable with pytorch openai gem works with pytorch if you are comfortable with tensorflow gem environments work perfectly with tensorflow as well and if you're new to python and you don't know tensorflow or pytorch i would recommend using numpy that's what we are going to be using in today's workshop. We will, we will write everything in NumPy. So uh, what should be our runtime type in Colab for this notebook? Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. You, if you don't change any settings, if you just open the notebook, since we are not doing any heavy processing, we don't need any GPU, TPU acceleration. We don't need any, uh, extra power so you can just open the notebook leave everything default and everything would be fine everything should work perfectly out of the box for now so the computing libraries are basically entirely your choice pick whatever you're comfortable with whatever you have been doing your programming in 
choose that and everything works perfectly with that. There's no right or wrong choice. Uh, PyTorch is more of um, Facebook made by Facebook or I think supported by Facebook. TensorFlow is more by Google, but they both have same functionality. The debate is TensorFlow better than PyTorch is like, it's just a personal opinion. They both have same functionality. They both give you exactly same kind of things. They give you same kind of simplifications that you're looking for. Or even if you don't find one in a standard way, you can always find alternative which is written by people. You can always head over to GitHub and, for example, there is something called TensorFlow Agents, which is a re which which is very very recent reinforcement learning library. Now there's no standard available for TensorFlow Agents in PyTorch, but there are many people who have already written alternatives to TensorFlow Agents for PyTorch. So picking the library of your choice is entirely up to you. You can always find everything in both. There is also uh, TRFL by DeepMind, you're absolutely right. Uh, why exactly we need to create an environment? Can we do all this without creating an environment? Okay, we're actually coming to that. The next topic after installing the libraries is exactly what we are going to discuss. Like, what is an environment? Why do we need it? What is an agent? This is exactly what we're going to be discussing now. So go ahead, go to your uh, notebook, run the second cell which is just importing Jim, importing NumPy, importing random because we're going to be using it to generate some random numbers at some point, and importing matplotlib just because I like it. I'm comfortable plotting in matplotlib. I haven't really tried any other plotting libraries in Python. Um, if you know any good one, please let me know. If, if there is any better or easier than matplotlib, please feel free to let me know. And then finally, we are importing the virtual display that we just created or that we just installed. So let me head over to your notebooks, run this cell, and let me know if it's uh, if it runs without any errors. T-bond library is also very nice. Okay, I will actually try that. I heard about it, but I haven't tried it yet. I will actually try that. So let me know if you run the second cell and if everything worked as we expected it. If there is an error, also let me know because we will also discuss some common sort of errors that you might run into. So let me know if it's working. Work for you, work for you, everything worked till now. Okay, sounds fantastic. The next thing is functions of environment and agent. What exactly is an environment and what exactly is an agent? This is the first question about reinforcement learning. Uh, first of all, I would like to know if you know what's the difference between supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. So let me know in the chat if you know the difference, uh, what's supervised, what's unsupervised, and what's reinforcement learning. Or if you, if you would like me to explain it a bit, maybe in one or two minutes. Please let me know in the chat if you know uh, the difference between these three or should I go over the difference? Okay, someone said they know. Um, others, please let Perfect, perfect. Okay, so it seems that everyone knows. I see one person who said, please explain. Okay, so in, in simplest possible terms, uh, supervised learning, you have a large data set, you have data and you have labels and you learn from it. That's the supervised learning. Unsupervised learning, you have the data, but you don't have any labels. So you mainly use some sort of clustering or you use some sort of other method which doesn't require the labels for training. Whereas reinforcement, in reinforcement learning, you don't have the data and labels. You don't have the data, you don't have the labels. Reinforcement learning is another type of machine learning which learns from interaction. There are actions and there are rewards. Instead of uh, the data and the labels, data and labels is the traditional machine learning approach in which you have some features and you have the labels and your goal is to basically teach uh, the agent, the learning agent that these features correspond to these, these labels. So over time it learns to predict the correct labels. But in reinforcement learning, the agent learns to take the correct actions. It's more of a decision-making process. You have an agent, 
which is your learning agent. But if we have some data and we still want to use reinforcement learning, OK, it depends what kind of data you have. If you have some data and you can convert it into the form of some rules of the game, if you can convert that data into the form of an environment, which I will explain sh shortly what an environment is, if you can convert it into an environment and if you can define a reward mechanism for it, then you can use reinforcement learning for it. The basics of reinforcement learning start with agent and environment. An agent is an actor. An agent is the person who is taking a decision, who is taking some action. And the environment is everything that surrounds him, everything that gives him a reward for doing the right action or doesn't give him a reward or gives him a negative reward or a punishment for doing the wrong action. So it's a lot like this. Please let me know if you can see this. In this figure, you're supposed to see. Um, I think I need to make it. OK, I will move the chat to another box for now. I think now you can see my full screen uh, for the Facebook audience. I will make my figure smaller or move it somewhere else so that you can actually see. What's on my screen? OK, so in this figure. The agent is the dog, which is going to take some action. Maybe it will fetch the ball. Maybe it will spin. Maybe it will roll over the ground. It will do some action in the hopes of getting a candy or a, a treat from the environment. So his environment includes everything that surrounds him, whatever gives him the reward. It can be an automatic treat uh, setup which gives him a treat for doing a certain action, or it can be a person, uh, for example, the owner who becomes happy with the dog fetching the ball and gives him a treat for fetching the ball. So the mechanism, the surrounding, which changes based on the agent's actions is the environment. The environment also includes states. For example, the initial state can be initial time, the environment then moves to the next state, which is the next time. For example, some actions might be useful in some states, but might not be useful in some other state. For example, uh, a kid doing a cute action when the mom is happy might get the kid some sort of candy or reward. But if mom is angry, she's in a different state. The same action might not get you a reward in that state. So the, the, the environment states matters uh, for the actions in reinforcement learning. The same action in different states can result in different kind of rewards. So let me know if you if you if you understand a little bit. Please zoom out a little bit. OK, I will let me come to the screen. So do you so far understand what an agent is and what an environment is? Agent is someone who takes the actions Environment is something that gives rewards for those actions. So far, so good. If there is any question, please let me know. Uh, the, the details of act, update, functions, we will go into the details of it later. Like we will go into details of it now. So far, agent and environment. These two concepts should be crystal clear to you now that agent is something that takes an render. We, we, we will go to render. Agent takes the actions, environment gives the rewards. That's the whole story so far. Now coming to the details of these functions and state and this, these things that we put on our screens. First thing we covered, what is an environment and what is an agent? Now the second thing is a state. I think I mentioned it a little bit, but let's go into a bit more details of a state. State can be time in case of some environments. State can be the mood of the person, like mood of the mom in another environment. If we take the example of some game, for example, the Atari games, uh, then state can be whatever is on the screen, current score, current velocity, current position. In case of a car, the state can be these things like speed, velocity, angle, uh, turning, torque, this kind of thing. They can be part of the state. So state is whatever represents the environment, whatever is changing 
in the environment with the actions of the agent. That is the state. If the agent takes the action, environment moves from one state to another state. That's a state. The next thing that we should understand is what is an action and what is a reward. So I think that's pretty intuitive. I would like you guys to explain to me what do you think is the action and what exactly is the reward? Let me know in the chat, what do you think? What are your thoughts on what's the action and what's the reward? From the explaining that I did so far, what do you think counts as action? Action means decision by the agent, absolutely. Exactly, exactly. I think you're all right. So action is the action of the agent. For example, fetching the ball or going left or going right, moving forward, moving backward. So these are the actions and the reward is whatever the environment gives in the reaction. Exactly. So. This, this is, I'm so glad to hear, see your responses. You're actually getting it very fast. So we can go a little bit faster then. So these functions, this, this, is, this is basically the drill. Now, this loop, these arrows, they are, once you master these, you master reinforcement learning. In every type of reinforcement learning, there will be this loop. In the beginning, there was nothing. Then came the initial state. So the beginning, the drill, to go over these loops, we need to see the drill a little bit. The drill, this is, this is the most important part of this workshop. If you master this, if you need a sip of coffee, please take it because we are coming to the most important part of the workshop. That's good. The drill. Remember, remember, remember this drill. Throughout this workshop, if you remember this drill, you can write the whole code. In the beginning, before we have started writing our code, there is nothing. Then there is the first, the first step of the code or first step of the reinforcement learning loop is reset, which is this function here. Reset is a function of an environment. So it resets the environment to the initial state. It doesn't take any input. This side shows basically the input and this side shows the output. The reset function is a function of environment. What, do you, what does it mean to be a function of environment? Well, just like any object-oriented programming language, environment and agent are two different classes now. There will be some variables which belong to the environment class some variables that belong to the agent class. And also there will be some methods or in MATLAB language, there will be some functions that belong to these two different classes. So the first function of the environment class should be the reset. It doesn't take any input. I see some questions here. Um, what's the difference between action and state? Action is the action of the agent. For example, left, for example, go right, for example, go forward, go backward. That's the action. State is a state of the environment. For example, if the agent takes the action, go left, the environment, which is the setting of that agent, might move to time step zero to time step one. Or if it's a game, then the environment itself might move one step left. So. The environment can have many variables as state. One of them can be time. Another one can be temperature. Another one can be, for example, the velocity, angle, this kind of variables that define the surrounding of the agent. So as a result of the action of the agent, environment moves from one step to another, from one state to another. For example, temperature can change from one time step to another one, or time always changes from one to another one. So it depends on us how we define the relevant state variables for the environment. Oh, the Apple example is really good. Good, good, you got it. You got it, that's awesome. 
So reset function doesn't take any input and as output it gives you the state and that state is what state? That's the initial state. So we can define only time, for example, as our state. In that case, when we reset the environment, it will give us zero, for example, time zero or t zero as the output. That will be our initial state. What do we do with the output of that function? We pass that output to the act function. Act function is a function of which class? It's a function of agent class. So agent class, this function takes this state as an input and as an output, it gives what action the agent wants to take. So this, this what does this function do? The act function, it takes as input what state I'm in right now for example, I'm in time zero right now. And what action do I want to take? Do I want to go left? Do I want to go right? Do I want to go forward or backward? Or do I want to fetch the ball? So the agent is going to decide on its action based on what state it's in. So it will take as input the state. Where am I? See the surroundings. Give the action that it wants to take as an output. That, okay, this is the action. This is what I'm doing. All right, so deciding an action comes from some sort of policy. We will go into the details of later, but the, the main point is the act, act function takes state as input, gives action as input, and that action is passed to another method of the environment. Method and function, I will be using them interchangeably. In MATLAB, we use the term functions, but in Python, the methods term is more common one. So I will be using them interchangeably just because I've used both languages for a while. Um, what does act need in its input? Act needs a state in the input. This, this red arrow, it shows the state going as input to the act function. And as output, it gives action, which then becomes the input for the step function. Once the agent, the dog has decided what it wants to do, it wants to fetch the ball. Okay, it tells the step function that I'm fetching the ball. This action, the action that the agent decided becomes the input of environment's step function because remember, environment is going to move from one state to another based on the actions of the agent. Sometimes environment may have zero effect from those actions, but sometimes it might entirely be defined. The next state might entirely depend on the action. For example, if your state variable is just time, then it doesn't matter what action the agent is taking. The environment is still going to step to the next time from time zero to time one to two to three. It's going to move to next time step anyway, but if it's some sort of Atari game or if it's some sort of environment that depends on the agent's action, then it's going to change according to the actions of the agent, just like an MDB. So the step function now takes as input action. And what does it give us as output? It gives us in a standard format four things. The next state. So the, if the initial state was time zero, it gives us time one as the next state or if the initial uh, state was some x y coordinate and now it, the environment is moving to another state then it gives us the next x and y coordinates for the next state okay that's the first output next state is the first output of step function the second output is the reward in most cases in most reinforcement learning cases it's a binary reward zero or one Reward one for the action which is beneficial or good. Reward zero for every other action. It can be a continuous reward as well. In, mo in some of the reinforcement learning environments, we will see some continuous rewards as well. So it, it, it all basically depends on our own specific needs. Is if our application needs binary rewards or if it needs continuous rewards. But in most cases, binary rewards are good enough. In some cases, we also introduce negative rewards when we want to discourage some sort of action. For example, if we don't want the dog to pee on the carpet, we will discourage it by negative rewards. Or if we don't want the car to crash into the wall, we will discourage that action with negative rewards. And the 
length and width of these rewards, for example, how high the positive reward can go or how much low the negative reward can go also depends on the needs of your application. If the negative action is so bad that trashing your car is just going to destroy any everything, then you put a high negative. You can put a high negative reward to that particular action. So defining which actions should have which reward is up to the programmer. You will define what's your environment and what are the rewards for what type of actions. That's one of the reasons reinforcement learning is called uh, supervision through rewards or learning through rewards. It's still a form of psychologically supervised learning, but you're learning from the rewards instead of from the labels. You're learning from the better rewards you get, you start taking more of those actions, the actions that resulted in higher rewards, and you start taking less actions that resulted in negative or zero rewards. So this is teaching the agent to act in a certain way or take certain decisions by giving good rewards or higher rewards for some actions and giving punishments for different actions. As simple as that. Okay, uh, what if, is it possible to set multi-agent to have individual rewards? Yes, it's possible, but we will go over it afterwards, maybe next time, or you can ask me later. I will answer the, in the details once we've covered the single agent. If the action involves risk, how do we model it? Well, if it involves risk, we give high negative rewards for it then. If we if we think that this action, the agent can take this action, we either exclude it from our action space, which is the next keyword that you should know about. Action space and observation space or state space. State space and observation space are used interchangeably. State space is normally used when you have a complete observability of the state and observation is used when you have partial observability of the state. It's still a state. It's still part of your environment, but the more common term that we use instead of state is observation since we don't see everything in the environment. So we call it observation. Partial observation of the environment or partial observation of the state is called observation. Okay. So next state reward. These two be covered. What do you think the flag done is? The flag done basically tells us if the terminal state has been reached. Done, the flag done is one if the terminal state has been reached or if one episode has ended. For example, if it's moving left or right in a state and it, the, the agent or the pendulum has reached the far right, the end of the frame, end of the screen, then we can say that, okay, the terminal state has been reached. So the flag done tells us one or zero. It gives us zero in every other state except for the terminal state. The debug dictionary is an optional argument as an output of the step function. If you want to pass some debug info, if you want to say something, uh, some detailed info as some string, if you want to give some warnings, you can pass them as a dictionary as an optional fourth argument of the step function as debug. So the four, the, the single input of the step function is action. There can be, Th these are not hard and fast rules. This is a guideline. So you can always modify these functions according to your needs. You can add more inputs, you can add more outputs, you can skip some outputs. It's entirely up to you to customize the agents as well as environments as your to up to your needs. But this, this is just a standard gym structure. I will explain why we need gym environments or uh, what's the purpose or use of gym environments anyway. So this is the step function. Next state, reward, done, and debug. These are the outputs of this step function. They are then passed on to something called update. Now, in this whole picture, where do you think the Q learning happens or where do you think the Q table, something which we say Q table, where do you think that happens? But what are your thoughts on it? Let me know in the chat. Where do you think the Q table is kept and updated? In, in this figure, you can point me out there. Yes, someone got two people, three people got the right answer. It's exactly in update function. So the Q table is maintained and stored and updated 
in the update function. What is a queue table? A queue table is just as the name suggests, it's a table which stores a queue value for every state and action. So on one axis, you have all the states. On the other axis, you have all the actions. So what would be the dimension of the queue table? What do you think in, in terms of any programming language that you've done in terms of a matrix or in terms of in terms of anything? What would be the dimension or size of the queue table? Yes, states times actions. Exactly. States times actions because we have one queue value for every state action pair. So for every state, for every action, we have a queue value. But uh, yeah, queue... um, sorry for interruption. Just when I like, I'm curious to know if your screen is freezed or are you moving around? So can you tell us at which stage you are in, in terms of your screen showing? Um, I'm at the screen where I have a picture of agent and environment on my screen. Okay, the same one. Yeah, Is yeah, because right? can you can you scroll can we scroll down to see if you're okay, perfect. So I just wanted to make sure that um, <laughs> we are not No, we are on the same screen because we are we are explaining the different functions. Yeah, I get so it. I get it. Just uh, just uh, received a message uh, from one of the guys. That's why I just wanted All to All right. Clear. Thank you. All sorry. Right. Thank you for letting me know. So the update function is where we keep our queue table and the, these are the inputs that the next state reward debug flag and this info these are the things that we need to update the queue table how we update the queue table is going to be the next thing we will have an equation which will take this reward into account and it, it will tell us which queue values we should increase which queue values we should decrease based on how much reward the agent got in which state for which particular action. That's the whole story. That's the game of reinforcement learning. That's what makes it so efficient. That's what makes it like so interesting to work with that all we need is just the information, the history of in which state the agent took what actions and how much reward it got for it. In, in a way, Qtable is just a way of maintaining this history that what was the state? What was the action the agent took and how much reward it got? So as you see, this is how we as humans learn. This is how we learn from our mistakes and our behaviors. We see that what actions led us to something good and what actions led us to something bad. And our brain processes it in a way that we start learning to do good actions more and we start learning to avoid the actions that led us to some sort of accident or some loss. So th this is how we work. Q learning is just a mimic. It, it's just mimicking the behavior of us or our learning, right? So uh, the last function here is the render function. The render function is an optional function. It does nothing, but as you see, it just takes input the delta difference, the update difference. This delta is basically just the difference of previous queue table value and the current value. It just tells us how much the queue table was changed in this particular iteration. And this render function just prints that information. We can print episode number. We can print how much accurate our agent is so far. We can print uh, how much it's learning in the render function. It's an optional function. You can print it uh, to see how your agent is getting trained, or you can entirely skip it if you want to make your process uh, faster, you can just print everything in the end if you want. So this is this render function is an optional function. Now I would like to hide this from you and then ask you a poll question. I would like to ask my colleague to show you our next poll question. I would like to ask you about something we just learned. I would like to ask you which one of these or how good you remember the drill? Which one of these is not a function of environment? Reset, step, render, or update. Now, no cheating. Don't go back to your files. Don't see it from there. Try to answer it from memory. Try to answer it from what you just learned. Don't cheat. So, while you're going to um, the answers, 
Uh, I will show you now what's the purpose of gym. What exactly is gym? How it works? What's the benefits of it or why we are why we care about it in the first place? Gym is nothing but a collection of reinforcement learning environments. So we saw in environments that an environment is supposed to do certain things and have certain methods. So gym basically provides you those methods pre-written. So I, I'm, I'm not going to mention to spoil the answer of the poll, but the, the gym methods are already provide the, the gym environments are already created. They are pre-written codes that give you an environment. And the methods that are supposed to be part of an environment, they are already there in those gym environments. Gym is basically created uh, for practicing reinforcement learning. The purpose of gym is that you can write your own agent, your own learning agent, how fast it learns, how good it learns, how fast it converges. You can write and modify your agents, and these can be different types of agents. You can write a Q-learning agent or SARSA or policy iteration, value iteration, temporal difference learning, actor crit critic, um, deep reinforcement learning, you can include recurrent neural networks in it. So you can write any type of agent you want. And then you can test the performance of that agent on one of these environments. That's the beauty of Jim. Since the environment functions are fairly standard and you know the inputs and outputs of these functions. So you can write one agent and test it on that Jim environment. Then you can write another agent as long as these inputs and outputs are compatible with each other you can then use the same environment to test your other agent. So this way you can compare the two agents you wrote. For example, you wrote one Q-learning agent, you wrote one SARSA agent, and then you want to, for example, compare their performances on the same environment. So you can apply both of them on the same gym environment and test it. For seeing like some gym environment or to see the gym uh, Codes, you can just go to open AI gym. When you go to open AI gym, you see this tab called environments. I will zoom in. Oh, wait, I'm zooming in the wrong place. So you can basically go to environments and see what environments are there. There are some game environments, some classic Atari environments. You can play around with them. You can create your agent, train it, see how good it plays the game. In that case, the environment is whatever you see on screen. That becomes your environment. So your actions define the next stage. It gives you some rewards. Then you have some uh, environments that teach you how to walk, how to not to fall. I would say. Then you have some classic control examples. These are one of the some of the examples that we will be trying out today. Card pole is one of the very classic problems in which you have to balance this pole on a card. You have a pole on a moving card and that you move the card left or right to keep the pole straight. The objective is that you don't want the pole to fall. So moving it, your action is go left or go right. So you teach the agent to learn to go left or right based on the angle, the velocity, the position of the pole, which are part of your state variables. They tell you, okay, the, the pole is about to fall. Okay, the, 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 what, what action should you take? You move left or right based on that to basically keep the pole steady or straight. Similarly, mountain car environments, pendulum environments, um, tooling robot environments. These are the classic control problems. You have some more exciting environments that need a bit more processing power, I would say. But yeah, you can you can teach them how to walk. Then you have some robotics environments. You have very, very exciting environments and you can also submit your own environments. Once you have written an environment for a different application, you can submit it to OpenAI Gym and it will become part of this this list this third party environments list where you will find 
all types of interesting environments. It's a long list and you will have fun experimenting with these. So coming back to our workshop, have you answered the poll questions yet? If you've answered the poll questions, uh, uh, please let me know. Let's see the poll results if we have. I would like to see how many of you got it right. Intafab, do we have poll answers yet? If we have them, I would like to see them so that we know how good everyone knows the drill. Okay, we got the answers. Oh, wow. So almost all of you got it right. Awesome. So you're listening. You're, you're, you're not sleepy. Let me know if you start getting sleepy. We, we can always take another break. Oh, you're good. All right, awesome. Uh, are you are you finding it interesting so far or is, has it become boring already? Let me know if we are going at a good pace because now we're gonna start typing a lot of code together. One last thing before um, exploring gym environments, there is something called spaces in uh, gym, sort of boring. Oh, I'm so sorry for that. I'm so sorry, I will try to make it more interesting. There is something called spaces in gym. Spaces is what we will use to define the uh, action space and the observation space. Since we defined our actions, we need to define an action space. And it's nothing but a collection of actions, a collection of allowed or legal actions, the actions that our agent is allowed to take. For example, in case of uh, dog, we cannot maybe uh, give an allowed action from jumping off the roof of the building. So we will define a set of actions, which, which, will, which we will call action space, from which it can try some actions. This is, this is sort of to restrict our agents not to take some arbitrary actions. And the same goes for observation space. In observation space, we will give a collection, a set of allowed states. If it's time, we will tell, okay, this is the initial time, this is the end time. Or if it's the frame of left and right um, in a game, then we will give the dimensions of that frame. We will give the coordinates of that frame that this is the beginning and end of this particular frame. Okay. Um, all right, let's close this. So you remember the drill. Now we are gonna see this drill in action. We reset the environment. We go to the initial state. That initial state, we pass it to the act function. What was the output of the act function? It was an action, right? So that action, we give it to the environment. From the environment, we get the reward. What function was doing it? It was the step function. That reward, but where do we pass that reward? We, we got four things from the step functions, right? So those four things, we pass them to the update function. And from the update function, optionally, we plot something by giving it to the render function, okay? Once that's done, we go back to step two, all, all right? So this loop repeats until our agent is sufficiently trained. Now, how we define sufficient training is also up to us. We define, we tell what's sufficient training for us. Is it if the agent has had 90% accuracy in the past 20 episodes, then stop training, then we put that condition. Or if we say, if the Delta update, the Q table update is sufficiently small, it's not changing much, then we say the agent has been trained enough, then that's when we stop training. Or we can always define a fixed number of episodes. We can say, okay, I want to run my environment for 200 episodes or 2,000 or 10,000 episodes and see what's the accuracy after that. Yeah, I yeah. know that you are in a very sensitive like situation. I wonder if we can like give a break because I see messages about break uh, for five minutes maybe. 
not too much. That's awesome. That's that's awesome. What Actually, you everybody. Though? Are should... you comfortable? Uh, are, you, are you comfortable with break right now? Absolutely, absolutely. Because okay, I'm gonna play are... a music. Uh, I'm gonna play a music. Perfect. So... Perfect. Does Q stand for some meaningful word? That's actually interesting question. Please let me know if you find out the answer. I I wonder why I didn't check. Please let me know. The scenario is without ending. No, you need to have a terminal state. Otherwise, you're you will be stuck in one episode. You move from one episode to the second only after reaching a terminal state. So if you don't have a terminal state, you're forever in one state. The question was that can we have uh, non terminal states? We keep going. Do we need to have a terminal state? So the terminal state is necessary to move from one episode to another, or you're going to have to define. Another way to move from one episode to another without actually going to the terminal state, then you won't use this flag, this done flag you will find another way other than this to move from one uh, episode to another one. So remember this drill, keep it in mind, let's do it now. So there is a common question that, okay, I don't want to work in Google Colab, it's difficult to debug in it or bad internet connection or I want to just work offline or a lot of other reasons. So can I just use all this uh, in a local machine? You can absolutely do that. You can install Gem the same way we installed it on Google uh, Colab. You can install it locally and you can do everything that you're doing here on your local machine. So let's go ahead and create our first Gem environment. Let's get the first Gem environment saying Carpool 1. You have this file, you can run this and you can make this environment. Now this code block, it does nothing but this line here, it makes the gym environment. Are you able to see the font uh, clear enough? If it's not clear, let me know in the chat and I will make it bigger. So once you have made the environment, we just reset it just for the sake of right now we're not doing the queue table update or anything we're just creating an environment and viewing it bigger please okay how about now so we're just making an environment and using the tools that we just imported and installed we are just rendering sort of this environment we are teaching random actions. Now the actions in the uh, first cart pole environment that I showed you, cart pole environment is this one. Okay, let's open it again maybe. So if we go to the environment, the environment name is cart pole v1 that I'm importing right now. So in this particular environment, the action is just left and right, which is modeled as a binary action, as a zero and one. One of them is left, the other one is right. So if I can give action is equal to one, or I can give action is equal to zero to make it go in that particular direction. So if I uncomment this, to uncomment, you can just use control and slash. So like you can use this for Sorry, this. You can use this particular command to quickly comment and uncomment a line. So I can comment the action that I was sampling from the action space of the environment, and I can just give my own action one or zero to always take. And this is just some printing. I'm just calling the step function, getting the four outputs from it, uh, then rendering using the render function. These are the built in gem functions that I'm just calling to just sort of show what an environment looks like. So we're not doing anything here except just always taking action one. So the cart will always be moving in only one direction and I'm only running this for a couple of episodes. I'm not running it for a very long time, but in your own time, when you want to see how this action space works, you can always 
take action one or action zero and you can run it for longer times to see. For now, what I'm going to do is there is a function called. When you do when you make the environment. It already gives you some action action space and observation space. We will go into details of that later. It also gives you a function called sample. So you can take you can choose one of the actions from the section space. So for example, if the action space contains action zero and action one, what the dot sample function does is it randomly picks one of those actions. So it picks either one or zero. Or if the action space contains forward, backward, left, right, then dot sample function will randomly pick one of those four actions. So whatever your action space is, it, it will randomly sample one of those actions. So this was just sort of a copy paste code. You can find it in many OpenAI gym related environments. If you want to see another uh, environment, for example, we can make a mountain car environment. So we just give a different name for the environment. Everything else remains the same. And we can just run it. So this time, just by changing the environment name, we just created a different environment and now we are just taking some random actions and we are just sampling it. Same goes with other gym environments. So that's basically the benefit of using gym environments that it gives you a standardized way of using environments. It tells you, okay, this should be your environment. These should be your methods and these should be the inputs and outputs of those methods. So you can reuse the gym environments. That's the biggest advantage of using OpenAI gym environments, in my opinion. But I would also put this uh, question to you that what, what other benefits do you think are there for using OpenAI gym environments? Do you, do you think is there any other benefit for uh, other than reusability for using these environments? Whatever you think, let me know your thoughts in the chat box and we can go over them a little bit. You can go ahead in your notebooks and you can try, you can render uh, these uh, environments. You can comment one or the other and you can try running them. You can see how they're doing. If you run into any sort of problem, you can let me know and we can go over them again. So take a few minutes, try to run them in your uh, notebooks and let me know. Someone asked, can we create an environment and use? Absolutely, that's what we are going to do today. At first, we are going to just write our Q-learning agent, which works with this predefined environment. After that, we will create our own environment and use the same agent on the environment we created rather than these predefined environments. If you change the number of iterations for this, what does it do in the drill? Well, it just runs the drill multiple times. If I give 10, it runs that drill loop 10 times. If I give 100, it runs the same loop 100 times. So it's basically learning more with more number of iterations. Error name gym is not defined. Well, you need to run. I think your runtime, this is one of the most common errors. It means that you need to import Jim again. You need to install and import Jim again. So the first two blocks that we run, you need to run the first one mm -hmm. and the second one again, and this error will go away. Once you do that, it, it will absolutely be fine. It happens when your notebook has been maybe disconnected for a long time, or if you didn't run the first two blocks, or for some other reason, sometimes the notebooks get disconnected due to some memory problems. So whenever your notebook gets disconnected, uh, you need to run the installation and importing scripts again before you can use them in moments. I hope it works. Please try in your notebooks and let me know if there are any other errors or if everything works fine. Once you try, let me know in the chat if everything is working. Someone got previous screen error. That's also because 
uh, you need to run the importing script again. For some reason, the screen did not get imported or installed correctly. So if you just run the first in, in sequence, the first block and the second block again, then everything should be working fine after that. OK, so these are some of the very, very common types of errors that you will run into. And as a beginner, it can be a bit overwhelming. So I encourage you to search for help on this kind of errors and you will actually develop a habit of searching this type of errors. You will get familiar with the forums or the places to look for the answers. Uh, one of the most common ways of getting help, as Faye mentioned on quite detail, are using help, using directory, going to the source code, or just Googling it. So OpenAI Gem has, it's, it's open source, of course, and it has the whole code available here in GitHub. So you can go and look at the code behind everything. For example, environments, these will be wrappers, spaces. You can see what gym spaces are, what type of spaces you can create for your action space and observation space. The box type space includes high, low data type. You can create a dictionary of your specific actions. For example, you can give a number and an array maybe. For example, you can say, speed and then you can give allowed speeds you can say uh, that the, the action can have multiple things at the same time in the form of a dictionary for example speed or acceleration or angle angle if, if you if you're driving a car your action uh, is not just you know go left go right it can have an acceleration at the same time as changing direction. So you can create a dictionary with that type of actions. So you can give whatever you want to be part of your action space. So spaces is a way to create action spaces and observation spaces. Spaces is a way to give a collection of actions and a collection of states or observations. States and observations, I will be using them interchangeably. So this is a way for you to give states and actions that are allowed in your environment and your agent. So you can create a dictionary, you can use discrete action spaces and observation spaces. There are some other types, multi-binary, multi-discrete. You can go into their description for more details uh, once you are more familiar with the action spaces and once you've gone past the initial smaller or kind of you know baby steps of action spaces and observation spaces, then you can go into different types of action spaces, observation spaces, and you can explore them. You can also go to GitHub and see the codes written by other people. Uh, you can, it's, it's always very simple process. You can just Google, for example, mountain car deep Q learning GitHub, something like that, or anything that comes to your mind, anything that you want. And you can open the GitHub links. You can see what they have written, how they're doing it. Uh, you can see how they're organizing their code. That's how I learned how to organize my code. Uh, it was from GitHub. I saw that people were using and reusing their codes by organizing into it, it into folders. They have one folder for environments, one folder folder for agents, another folder for memory, another folder for policies. So. Every time they are writing a new code, they just import an old file with it and make modifications that they need. For example, I can import another environment from the environments folder, another agent from the agents folder, and I can then use them together. So use, reuse, reuse, and re, re, reuse your codes. Don't waste your work after using it one time, after writing your code. Don't just leave it behind for, you know, forever reuse this code again and again, build on it in your future versions. So as they mentioned, whatever function you need elaboration on, you can run, uh, for example, help, or you can run directory, and it will give you some sort of basic information. But if it's not clear, you can always just go to Google and you can write help with this gym function or any sort of question, for example, what does step function do in reinforcement learning, and it will give you more uh, information about that. 
this is just another way of opening help. This is also, as Pei mentioned, another list of things that you can do with certain things. So, uh, what if you need to do some environment specific tasks in your code? For example, you want to get some information from the gym environment. You created the environment. The way to create a gym environment is just by environment name. All, all of the existing environments, you just give environment name. You say gym.make and you give the environment name and it makes the environment. Now in ENV, you have everything available. The things that you can do with ENV, you can find them with directory ENV. So for example, you know here all the things that you can access. You can do render, you can do reset, you can do step, you can find, you can close the environment, you can find the action space. For example, let's see the action space of this environment. Uh, let me create a code block here. I can say env dot action space dot sample to see one of the action that it samples. To run this block, you can just enter control enter. It gave me action zero. Let's run it again. Action two, zero, one. So it seems it has a discrete action space of actions zero, one, and two. And they might correspond to different things. So whenever you want to uh, see more details, just run a couple of times or just get more help on the function. Uh, if you want to, for example, print the environment name after creating it, you can unwrap the environment and from the specifications, you can get the ID of the environment. For example, I want, if, I, if, you, if you're writing a code and you want to do one thing for one environment, but another thing for another one, you can put conditions in your code. Like for example, if, Cartpole is in the environment name, then do this. If mountain car is in the environment name, then do something else. There can be minor differences in gym environments itself. For example, one environment can have discrete state space or another environment can have a different type of state space. So you can write this type of conditions so that your same loop, one code works with all type of environments. So this kind of conditions or unwrapping environment specifications will help you reuse your codes. So far, so good. Let me know if you have any questions. Take take your water, take your coffee, and let's let's write uh, codes now. What is observation space? Observation space is basically your state space. The terminology state space and observation space is used interchangeably. State space, when you have full knowledge of the environment, when you know everything there is to know about the environment, and observation space, then you have partial observability, when you know a couple of things, when you know maybe time and temperature, but you don't care or don't know the humidity. So we use the term observation space more often to define the environment variables, things that are changing in the environment. Those are our observation space. Why did we choose random action from agent? Don't we have to do actions based on states? Exactly. We chose random actions because we just wanted to see how an environment works. How does it look like? We haven't started teaching anything to the, to, to the agent yet. We just saw that if it takes the random action, then this is the kind of action it will be taking. And now we will start teaching it how to take the right actions. So, Let's write our agent now. Uh, for someone who said it's not working now, uh, please go back to the copy that you originally made and try to run that one maybe. This is why we uh, use two copies. So if you're if it worked first time, you might have made some sort of changes accidentally or some indentation left and right, which is making it not work now. So you can either go back to GitHub and clone it again and run it again, or you can go uh, to your own second copy, make another copy with it and run from there. So always have a backup plan, always backup your codes. 
have a version control system always. The essence of Qtable. Uh, what do agents do? Agents take an action. What functions an agent will have? There were, if you remember, how, how well do you remember the drill? What were the functions of an agent? Don't look at your uh, notebooks. Let me know in the chat what are the actions, what are the methods that belong to the agent class? Very good. That's awesome. That's awesome. Very, very good. So you are you are with me. You, you are learning with me. To do those, the most important function is the update function in which we will update the Q table. Now this equation is from the mother of reinforcement learning book. This book is literally, it has everything you need to do, need to know about reinforcement learning. This is how we will update our Q table. Now Q table has two dimensions. Name base is not defined. You need to import base 64. Just write import base 64 and then try to do it. So Q, S, A, Q, S, T, and A, T. S, T represents state, A, T represents action, and T represents time at that moment. So Q value of this state at that time and this action, by this I mean a particular action, at that time is updated as the value that was plus alpha, which is a learning rate, times the reward that you got, RT plus one, plus gamma times maximum of Q value of the next state. Time here represents my state, or T plus one represents my next state. ST represents my current state, ST plus one represents my next state. So maximum of Q value of next state, initially they will all be zero. So we get these values, we subtract our current Q values from it. So this is basically just the Q table update. We just follow it as is. This is how uh, Sutton and Barto book tells us how to update your Q table. This is Q learning equation. It's based on Bellman update. There are proofs why it converges, how fast it converges. Uh, if you're interested in those, you can just Google convergence of Q learning or the math behind Q learning, and you can basically go over them. Uh, but for now, this is the equation. We will write our agent with it. So let's create a class called agent. I think you have uh, this already with your file. Don't run this file yet because it has some missing pieces, missing codes that we will be writing together here now. So what we want to do is see what parameters do we have uh, in this class. We have the learning rate. We have the gamma parameter that we will need here. Learning rate is this alpha. Also, we have action space. We have observation space. We have number of episodes. Uh, we have observation space length and action space length. These are just, what's the difference between small and s? I think that's just a typo while I was writing this. It should be, I think, big s here as well. There's no difference. It's just a typo on my part. Thank you so much for noticing. So uh, we just create these parameters that we got as an input to our agent class. We just assign them in our initialization. In the queue table, notice what we're doing. We are just initializing it randomly. You can initialize it to zeros. You can initialize it to random numbers. It doesn't matter. You just need a table. It's a common practice to initialize it to zeros as well. So if you want to initialize it to zero, you can initialize it to zero as well. And the size of it will be your uh, observation space times your action space because we will have, remember, remember, we will have one Q value for each state action pair, okay? So we are initializing our Q table randomly here. 
There is another parameter called epsilon, and we will talk about it at the end of this workshop. But for now, remember that epsilon is something which is used to balance exploration versus exploitation. Exploration versus exploitation means that should I take a random action in this state to know that I might get a higher reward, or should I take the action which has previously given me the highest reward? For example, if spinning around gave the dog a treat, next time, should the dog just spin, or should it try to go fetch a ball if it hasn't done that before, hoping that it might get more treat for that or higher reward for that. So this, this dilemma of balancing, should we take just the actions that gave us previous reward, highest previous reward, or should we try a new action from the action space? It's called exploration versus exploitation dilemma in reinforcement learning, and epsilon is one way to balance it. It basically tells us that, okay, take the, the best action, the action with best reward with a certain probability, and take a random prop action with a certain probability. And this probability is changed throughout the training. In the beginning, the probability of choosing random actions is more, but as the training progresses, the probability of taking random action decreases because we expect that now we have learned enough to know that, okay, the actions that generated the best reward are actually the best actions. By as the training progresses, we are assuming that we have tried all actions enough times already to know what was the reward for them. Okay, so far so good. Still not working, should I just carry on? Uh, yes, please carry on. Just copy the file again from GitHub and try to carry on, try to follow as much as you can, and we can fix some problems later then. Let's write the act function. Now, let me know in the chat, what were the inputs and outputs of the act, act function? What does it take as input? And what is it supposed to return as output? Let me know in the chat. I'm reading your chat now. Input state, output. Oh, now we have different opinions. We are getting some, some people are saying reward. Remember the drill. Remember the drill. Okay, go back to your notebook. Go back to the drill. Go back to the picture that we, that we saw before. And then let me know the inputs and outputs of this function. Okay, perfect, perfect, Paul. Yes. Okay, it seems like most people now got it. So what does this, this first line, now this, this is the part where you will write the code with me here. Read the comments. It says this, this is the function that takes the observation as input, and I have also given it as an optional uh, action, as an optional element uh, input, the episode number. If the random number that we generated is less than epsilon, which basically means that with this certain probability, return a uniformly sampled random action from action space. How would you do that? If you just want to sample a random action from action space and you want to return it, how would you do that? And the second line here, this one says, return the action that has the highest Q value in state observation O. Now remember, our Q, value, our Q table already has some values. Our Q table has a dimension already, it exists. So we can do that, we can do the argmax or we can do the max operation here. So these two lines, first let's focus on the first one. Try to write it. How would you do that? How would you return 
a uniformly sampled random action from action space. We've done that before. That's a hint. Ransom's function, that's very good option. It's very, very good option. You can do that. Try to go over the notebook and the question. Yes, someone actually got. Wow, more than one person actually got the exact right answer. Yes, yes, you're doing very good. You're actually doing really, really good. Exactly, we to return a random action from our action space, we can use the dot sample function. So let's do that. We can return environment dot action space dot sample. Now there is a mistake in this code. This is what most people told me so far. Now, when we are writing it inside this class, there is a little bit of a mistake here. What's the mistake? Yes, someone got it. We should use self because we passed the environment section space to this function as we passed it as an input to this class and we already have it in self now self dot action space. So we can use self dot action space dot sample. First part is done. Second part, which will take you a little more time. Return the action that has the highest Q value in this state observation. Now let's try to do that. You have the Q table here. This is the Q table, self dot Q table. It has a certain dimension that you know of. You know current observation is O. So you want to return the Q value. That you want to return the action that has the highest Q value. Now remember Q table. Q table has. States and actions on one dimension, you have all the states on the other dimension, you have all the actions. So you you first want to go to the relevant state Q table of that. State. Once you have that, then you want to know in that particular row, which action has the highest Q value, or basically you need to do an argmax operation to know which action has the highest Q value. So you will return that action since it has, you know, Q values for each action. You will return the action that has the highest Q value. Try to do, do that. Think it over, take a few minutes and try try to come up with some answers. Let me know in the chat, then we will proceed. Basically, Q value is the reward for corresponding action. No, it's not the reward, it's the Q value. It corresponds to the reward, but it's not the reward itself. It's a value that changes with reward. It increases and decreases in each episode. It's not the exact reward, but it's proportional. Someone got the answer very close. Very, very close, but not quite right. Yes, we will use argmax. Operation, we will use NP dot argmax. Or if we are using max, then you will need value and index and index is the one that we will use. Yes, size of Q, Q table is correct. Second parameter, we won't use it in this particular equation. The episode number, it's only to balance exploration and exploitation, and I already used it wherever I wanted to use it. Yes, now I see like people are starting to get it. A lot of people actually are getting it right. The common mistake is that a lot of people are suggesting this is what a lot of people are suggesting. NP dot argmax of self dot Q table. Now I would like some of you who got the right answer 
to point out the mistake in this. This one is the most common answer that I got so far. There is a little bit mistake in it. What do you think is the mistake? Yes. So a lot of people now after this got it. We need to go to the corresponding observation. There are multiple ways of doing it. This is just one of the ways you can explicitly define the action. Uh, sorry, the axis. You can use just the max with axis is equal to zero. So th there are multiple ways of doing this. It's just the just a matter of syntax. This is just one of the ways. But yeah, this is the value that we are looking for. Uh, Paul, again, Q table, argmax. Argmax is what gives us the argument that has the highest value. For example, if you have a Q table, it has only two values. The first box is, let's say, 10. The other box is, let's say, 20. So argmax is a max operation over this, but it tells us the index, the place of the maximum value. So argmax tells us, okay, the the look that this location the box that has 20 it gives us the location of the box instead of the value 20 so here we're not interested in the maximum q value we are interested in the action that gives the maximum q value that's why we're taking argmax okay so did you all get this so far by writing self q table of o we are going to the row of the Q-table. Q-table is a table. You can visualize it as a table. It has uh, rows, uh, or you can say the first axis corresponds to the states, which are, which are represented by O's. These O represent those states or those observations. And the other axis, the other dimension represents the actions. So first we go to the corresponding state, so we have, if we have two actions, we will have only two values now, and we want to see which one of these is bigger, and we want to choose the index of the bigger value. I hope it makes sense now. We are dealing with a table. With a, with, we are dealing with a two-dimensional array, if it makes sense to you. We are, or in MATLAB terms, we are dealing with a matrix, a two-dimensional matrix. The values correspond to rewards. They change with rewards. We will see how they change. They are not exactly the rewards as is, but they change. They add, subtract with rewards. We multiply and add, subtract rewards with something to actually change them. So far, so good? OK, let's write our final function now. The update function. Here we are going to implement the equation that we just saw. The equation was old, val old Q value plus learning rate times the reward plus gamma times maximum of next stage's Q value minus current Q value. So this equation is something that we are going to implement. Let's let's try to do that and let me know what do you think. First thing, what's the old OA value? We want to store old Q value here. How do we do that? Old OA means just whatever the Q value is at this particular O and this particular A. Update function, always remember, remember the drill. Update function, what does it take as inputs? O, A, R, and next day, next observation, O prime. We call it O prime here. What does it give as an output? It gives the difference between current Q table and the updated Q table. How much the Q table has changed in this iteration. So we need to know the old O, A value, which means old just means current. Or just means whatever we have before the update. So before we update the Q table, what's the Q table value for this O, which we got as an input? 
and this A. How do we access it? How do we get this value? Let me know in the chat. It's very easy. Where do we have Q table? We have it in self dot Q table, right? From self dot Q table, this is the entire Q table. We want to get Q table of O and A. Now, this is also another just matter of syntax. There are multiple ways to do it. So depending on the programming language of your choice, depending on the libraries you want, uh, there are multiple ways of doing it. This is just one of the right ways of doing it. OK, so we got the old Q O A value. Now we want Q prime value. Q prime, what do you think Q prime is from O prime? From this description, estimate of the optimal future value or maximum Q value in observation O prime. What do you think Q prime is? What's your what comes to your mind from the word? No, Q prime is not the new Q value. From the description, we see that it says Q prime is the maximum Q value in not the observation O, but the observation O prime. So Q prime is still a Q value. So we know it's going to come from the Q table. Right. It's going to come from there, but it's the maximum. Over all the actions. It's. It's coming from O prime. Now this this part, it gives us the. The two Q values. In O prime, right? And we need maximum Q value here, not the action that has maximum Q value. Q prime is the maximum Q value in the state O prime. So how do you think we can find the max of this? Do we need arc max here or do we need just the max? We want Q value, not the action that has maximum Q value. So what, what do we need here? Just the max, absolutely right. We just need the max. And that's it. That's all we got. Now we have the original old OA value, which corresponds to this value in this equation, old OA value. We have alpha, we have reward as input to the function, we have gamma. Now max over Q in the next state over all actions, this is Q prime, right? This is exactly what we did. We went to Q table in the next state, O prime state, and we took max over all A's, max of Q. So we have the Q prime, this value, this term. We also have this term that we needed before, right? So can you write uh, this equation from these values now? O underscore A and O prime variables are a bit confusing. Can you redefine these terms? Okay, which ones O? underscore a o underscore a is not a variable o is observation a is action so when we say q underscore o underscore a value we just mean q table of this observation s is o remember in your mind state is observation so q of this particular o and this particular a that's what o a means got it and what was the other thing you asked? Can you ask again, please? O prime. O prime is just, this is, if ST is O, then S of T plus one, next, next observation is O prime. 
Current state is O. Next state is O prime. All right. Does it make sense? OK, perfect. Alpha is the learning rate. Absolutely. Alpha is the learning rate. So we have alpha in self dot LR. We have gamma also self dot gamma. So we have all these terms now. Let's write the equation. OK, we have our first answer for the Q table. Uh, your, I'm sorry if I'm present. I'm saying the name wrong. Siraj, uh, your Q table equation is absolutely right. It's just missing some indices. We don't want to update Q. When you say self dot Q table, we mean Q. We want to update Q only for this S and this A or only for this O and this A. So your equation is only missing the relevant indices. Let's write this part. Only this part first. Let's let's call it uh, normally this term from here to here. Is called TD target. In reinforcement learning terms. So we can say here we can create something called. TD target. And we can try to implement uh, only part of this equation, this part. So it's reward plus gamma times Q prime, right? So we can say here reward, we have it as R as input to this function. So we can just say R plus self dot gamma times Times, what did what do we need here? We just computed it. This this value. What did we call it? Yes, we called it Q prime. Do we need to put self with Q prime? Why and why not? Okay, perfect. So far, you're following perfectly. Because it's a variable of a function. Absolutely. Now, since we have this term as TD target, this part, can we implement the rest of the equation? Okay, absolutely. Go ahead. Let's write the rest of the equation. Absolutely. Someone already got it right. Someone already. Got it absolutely right. So I'm just going to do exactly what we said we will do in this equation. Self dot Q table of what values? O and A. This is what we want to update. And since in Python, it's a matter of syntax, I can do plus equals for self addition. So I can write it like this. Then I can do self dot learning rate times. Now, what are the values that I need here? After the alpha, my alpha is here. This is my alpha. This is the term I already computed. What did we call this term? We said this term is called TD target. TD target. What's the other term? Minus old, what did we call it? Old underscore OA value. So self dot Q table is now complete. What do we want to return? We want to return the difference of the new and the old Q table. So what can we do? Now our new value is this, right? And our old value, we already have it. This value minus our old value. Did everyone get it? Yes. 
we have our agent class complete now. Environment, we already have it from Gem. So now we can run this particular agent on this particular environment by writing the loop that we said we will write, the drill that we discussed. Are you ready for that? Okay, let's do it. Let's run this class. Did I run it? Let's run it again. Okay, we have our class ready. The next function is just for discretization of the environment that we are using. For now, you can just use it as it is. If we find time at the end of the workshop, I will explain what it does. In simple words, it just discretizes some states. Let's try to create the agent that we just made. Let's try to pass some values for learning rate, gamma, action space, environment, everything that we just said. And let's try to print the shape of the Q-table. Do this step and let me know if you're getting the same shape for Q-table as I just did. May error agent is not defined. You did not run your class agent. The block that defined the class agent, you didn't run it. Or, it's, or it resulted into some error. Okay, everybody else got the same shape. Wonderful, wonderful. Let's go to the next step. Now we need to write a loop for training the agent. Uh, error namespaces is not defined. Uh, the same thing, your runtime got disconnected. So that in the imports, when we imported gym spaces, you need to write, you need to run that block again. Basically run everything from the beginning until this point and it should be fixed. Can I show the code I wrote again? Absolutely. So this is the, these are the lines that, that I just wrote the act function and the update function. What I will do is I will update this save in GitHub. So that you can actually access it. In case you are running into some errors, I've updated the file, the GitHub file that you already have the link to, you already have access to it. And this error is very common. You will run into it multiple times. So just keep reloading until you get the file. So if all the changes that we've made so far, you have them in the GitHub file now. Could I see update queue table based based i think you mean qtable update equation so here it is i will leave it on the screen for a couple of minutes for you guys to follow also we have the next poll now and i'm pretty sure all of you are gonna get it right which one of the following is the correct sequence from the drill always always remember the drill so is it act step update act update step step act update And as I mentioned before, no cheating. Let me know if you guys feel super tired and if you want to take like a five minutes break. <laughs> Someone found a cheat. Someone asked Qtable is always two dimensional matrix. No, it depends on the size of your action space times your observation space. So 
if your action space is one dimensional and your observation space is one dimensional, then Qtable is two dimensional. But if they have more dimensions, if your action space itself is three dimensional and your observation space is two dimensional, then it's like three cross two. So the dimension of Qtable always depends on the dimension of your action space and observation space. OK, a little break. All right, so before we start writing our loop, which is the final part of this workshop, let's take a five minutes break. Uh, until then, feel free to get a coffee, get this uh, updated file. If you're running into some errors with your own file, you can get the latest one from GitHub again. Action space is not simply the list of allowed actions. How can it be multidimensional? Yes, it can be multiple multidimensional in a way that, for example, if your action, one action in driving the car contains the angle that you want to uh, divert to, the speed at the same time that you want to increase or decrease. So your action space can be multidimensional in the way that it has angle and speed. So they, they are both the variables that are changing at the same time. So you have allowed speeds in your action space and you have allowed angles, allowed directions in your action space. Right? Make sense? Well, Qtable is automatically created from, someone asked this about the size of Qtable changing with size of action space and observation space. Since Qtable is already created from action space and observation space, the size will change automatically with it. Sometimes you might need to make some adjustments to it manually, but most of the time it will take care of it. Let's take our five minutes break. It's 1240. We will come back at 1245. Take your copies. Feel free to ask your questions in the chat and I will take a look at them again in five minutes. Let's write our training loop. Let me know in the chat uh, if you've answered the poll. Let's see what are the poll answers. I'm sure all of you got it right. Let's see if we have the poll results by now. Yes, we have the poll results. Yes, you got it right. Okay. So moving on, let me just open chat in a separate window. I would like to verify if there is a, oh, I see you have a bunch of questions here. Unexpected indent. If you have any indentation errors, just use the latest file that I uploaded in GitHub. It's very common, it's very normal to have some indentation errors. It's not a big deal, it's okay. You'll get better with time, it, it's all right. You would like to verify there is a difference between reset and state function. I understand that the prior is only called one, but I'm asking in relation to the poll. Uh, step and reset function. Well, step function, they both have same output. It, it, they give you the next state. The reset function is called at the beginning of every episode. We will do that in the training loop now. Whenever an episode, whenever a terminal state has reached, we go back to the initial state. Whereas the step function just moves the environment from one step, one state to another until the terminal state has reached. After the terminal state, we, re we reset the environment back to the initial state. It's, it's a very good question. All right, so if there are no other questions, let's move on. I'm sorry, I'm not really looking at the Q&A section. I hope somebody is taking care of the Q&A section. Uh, due to the limited screen space, I am only seeing the chat right now. So if you want to ask some question directly to me, write it in the chat. Uh, or if you have some question which you need detailed answers to, write it in the Q&A section and somebody from the team will help you with that. Okay, so, so far so good. We created our agent. Do you see my screen clearly and if, does, is everything working okay for you? Also from the team, can someone check if everything with the stream is also going well? 
let me know if there are any problems. I will keep my WhatsApp open on the side and let's let's finish everything together. So the main loop for training is easy to figure out. We will start by uh, Adia, you need to share your screen. Oh, sorry. Let me share it again. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mansoor, for letting me know. All right, guys. So let's start with some parameters that we are going to use. Remember, when we created our agent here, we were passing these parameters manually, learning rate, gamma, action space, environment space, everything. So we can just write them here at the beginning of our training loop. The environment that we are using from Jim is called Cartpool, and it has discrete action space. Like the action space is not one dimensional. It has uh, position, velocity, angle. So it's a, it's a multi-dimensional action space. That's why we are sort of, and it, it's continuous. So we are manually discretizing it. For now, you can just copy this part as it is. I think you already have it in your code. You can ignore it for now. We will go into the details of it later. And the same thing goes for the cart pole environment. Since we need to discretize it, we are creating different observation space length and action space length. Action space length will be the same. We are just getting it from the environment itself. But observation space length, since we are discretizing it, we are giving some something relevant, something specific to the environment here manually. It wouldn't be a big deal once you start getting used to the reinforcement learning environments a lot. Just like we created our agent here in this test box, now we are actually creating it again here using the parameters that we just defined. We defined how many episodes we want, what should be the learning rate, what should be the gamma. After defining these, we are again just exactly like before creating the agent. After creating it, we are just rendering it once to see. We also created some parameter called display every which means I just want to display it every 100 episodes to see what's going on with the environment. OK, so far we haven't started the actual thing. The else part is for another environment. Once we want to use the same code on another environment, we will be using the else part. So you can ignore it for now. You can choose, you can create flags like show verbose or render gym if you want to see the training or if you want to. Just for now, I'm going to choose uh, show verbose. We can keep it false, but render gym, I'm going to change it to true. And I'm going to reduce number of episodes because if I run it for the whole episodes, it, it will take forever. So I will create number of episodes. Uh, 10,000 is OK, maybe might not be too much. Then again, we are creating some variables in which we are storing our accuracy or our delta, whatever gym environment returns as a performance in indicator. To store them, we are just creating some other variables. This is where our training loop begins for episode i in range number of episodes. Now you can create a while loop like until done or until this much accuracy reached or any other type of loop. It's, all, it's totally up to you for how many iterations you want to run your loop. So I'm running it for 10,000 episodes. We can, the first step that we need to do after just initializing our parameters is remember, remember the drill. What's the first step at the beginning of the episode? What do we do? We reset the environment and we get the initial state. We get the initial observation O. So let's do that. Our O is equal to what? env dot reset. Is everybody with me so far? Let me see your answers. Yes, everybody got it. Everybody says V reset. Does reset function take any arguments? Do we need to give any arguments to the reset function? No. 
So that's it. This is all we need to do. We just get O from the reset function. That is all we needed to do in this code block. That's it. What do we do after the reset function? This is now the environment has been reset. And now uh, this, this part, the if part, you can ignore it. This if part is just discretizing that state that we just got, right? Uh, while not done. Well, this basically means this done flag is the done flag that we are getting from one of the functions. Which function is that? Which function gives us the done flag or end of episode or terminal state flag? Which function is that? Let me know in the chat. There is a function that we have. There is a function. You can look at the picture that we discussed and you can tell me there is a function that gives us four outputs. Next state, reward, done, and a dictionary. Okay, yes, all of you got it right. This is the step function. Step function gives us the flag done. So this done flag, while not done, this flag we set it to false somewhere. Done is equal to false. We are starting with done false, that it's not done. So this while loop will run until the terminal state has been reached. Now, what does the first thing say? The first thing here, the first comment tells you call the act function. Remember the drill. What's the, what's the first thing we do after reset? We call the act function from the agent and we get the action that the agent wants to take, right? Because the act function returns the action, right? And when we wrote this function, what were the input arguments that we gave to the act function? Call this act function and let me know in the chat exactly in the exact syntax how you would write it. Let's see. So far, I haven't received any answers. Okay, someone called the function correct, but it has to have an output and you have to store that output somewhere. It returned. Yes, somebody got it almost. Okay, someone got it perfectly. Okay, so you're all you're all doing right and at least along the right lines. So the output is A, the action, right? We are calling it where, on which class? Is it agent class or is it environment class? This is what most of you, I'm seeing in the chat, most of you are missing it. Which class? Agent class. So agent, where is agent? Agent dot act. And it takes input what? This already tells us here that it takes O. So we can say O is equal to O. And it takes as argument episode I, which is equal to, we call this the same thing here in our loop. I hope the spelling, we kept the spelling same. Yes, we kept the same. All right, so far so good. Let me know if there is any confusion so far. We got the action from calling the act function. All right, what's the next step? We need to pass this action to which function now? Yes, agent with capital A is for the class and with small a is with for the instance of the class that we created here, agent. Remember, keep in mind the capital one is for the class and the small a is for the instance of that class that we created. After act, which function do we call? Some of you are getting it right. Yes, we call the step function. To call the step function, what does it return? What does it give as output to us? It gives us O prime, next state. It gives us R, it gives us done, and it gives us a dictionary which we didn't pass, so we can put an underscore there. 
since we are not getting an output from it. Okay. So this function is a function of which class? Environment or agent? Environment or agent? Environment, that's right. So environment dot set. What are we passing to it? Action that we just got from the previous step. We called it just A. Or we can say the full form. We can say action is equal to A. So far, so good. Let me know if you're with me. Write that down, write this down in your notebook. And let me know when it's done. If there are any questions, confusions, let me know. Which function do we call after the step function? Yes, we can just write it. Yes, exactly. We call the update function next. Absolutely right. Uh, this step you can ignore the card pole. This is just for the discretization. Whenever we are calling, you will notice whenever we're taking an observation, if the environment is card pole, we are discretizing it. That's all. This is the only difference for card pole environments. It won't be there for other environments if the environment already has discrete observations. So we call the update function. This update function takes as input O A R O prime. So we pass these arguments to this. And we, we created an empty list here called delta update. So the, the, the delta update that this function returns, we are just appending it to that list. You can have another syntax. You can store it in the form of a numpy array or whatever form you like. So we are calling this delta update function. After updating it, now there's no function in the drill that we call. We, we have reached all the functions that we were uh, that we wanted, but there is one very, very important step. If you miss this step, you will kind of lose your progress. What's that step? The environment, we did all the act up the step update sequence. Now the environment needs to move from one state to another, which means our current state has become our next state. Reward part that's done. Reward when we took the step function here. Someone is mentioning about the reward. When we did the step function, it already gave us the reward. All right, so this part is already covered. Now we just need to move the environment to the next state. Our O becomes O prime. Let me know if you have any confusion about this part or if you're with me so far. Are you with me so far? If there's a confusion, let me know because this, this step is very important. We are telling that whatever our, our O prime was due to the section, now our O has moved to that. We are kind of moving the environment from one state to the next. If the time was zero before, now it's one. If it was one, now it's two. This is what we are doing. Are you following so far? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So basically, the next part is just sort of plotting it, showing it, storing the values, the delta value, the reward value, things that we need to store for plotting 
how our accuracy is changing, how our training is progressing. So basically we've written all the important parts that we needed to write. We can just go ahead and run this. And we have some sort of error. Oh, mountain car environment. We don't have, we don't want to run it on mountain car environment. We want to run it on cart pole environment. because this is because of the discretization step. Let's change our environment to the card pool. Let's go ahead to the first step. Either we change it here or we can change it separately. Also, we don't need to run the whole thing. Just where we created our environment. This is the agent. It remains the same. This is the environment. So before this, we create a code cell. We write this. We say environment name is equal to cart pole because we want to run this environment on cart pole environment since we included the discretization step. So as you can see, this is running. Did we create the environment before it? Okay, I'm gonna stop the training for now just to make sure that we created the, the right environment. This is just the environment name. Creating the environment part was something we did before. So let's create this environment here. So that we have the card for uh, the session crashed. This is something which will happen a number of times to you. Whenever this happens, you need to run all the steps that we ran up to the current step uh, all together. To do that, you can do exactly what I'm doing right now. You can go to runtime and you can say run before, or you can press control F8. What it does is it runs all the cells until this cell. So I want to run all the cells until this cell and then run this one manually. I want to make sure there are no errors in the previous one. Okay, I, it looks like they all ran correctly. Now we can run this one. Okay, now we have the right environment. It's learning. Once it's done learning, we can plot some accuracies and some matrices. And Faye already showed you how to make the plots look fancier, how to use different markers, how to use bigger sizes. So use all of them, especially when you're making some figures for scientific publications. It's always a good idea to use different line types and line markers, maybe not the line colors if you want to save on, you know, colored publication, but markers, line types, uh, ligands. These are very, very good options to actually make your figures look clear, crystal clear for the scientific publications. I'm not sure if you noticed there are multiple options to download your figures. You can download them in PNG form, in vector graphics forms, uh, in EPS forms. So if you're making figures for uh, scientific publications, I would recommend using the EPS format. Let me know if you have any other uh, format, which is your favorite, which you find better for scientific publications. For now, I'm using EPS.
This is also uncompressed and another option. I think, yes, I think you're right. You're getting an error in assertion in environment dot step. Environment dot step should not have any assertion. If there is any assertion, you can comment it out. If you have a custom environment, you can basically just still you will have environment dot action space environment dot observation space. So from there you can pass their sizes. OK, for some people who are running into some errors, I will. Save the latest copy in the GitHub. So that you can access it. The errors that you're getting are pretty common. Some of them will be assertion errors, data type errors. Sometimes you explicitly need to give some types. Uh, yes, this will override the previous copies. So that's that's the thing with version control. You can still go to history and find previous copies. If you go to histories, you can find which version you want and you can open it. So latest version right now is this one. You can go see previous versions as well. You can see the changes that I made. So if you want the latest file, you can just go to the repository and you can open the file from there. That's, that's the reason that at the beginning of the workshop, uh, I asked you guys to make a copy for yourself if you want to practice later for another time, if you want to replicate all these steps again in your spare time. I hope you have the copies of that. If not, I can always give you an empty copy again. OK, the latest uh, copy is available in GitHub, and I think it's about to finish running the training. Let's see how many episodes are done. Whenever you're rendering an environment, it takes quite a long time. It's less for custom environments that you create yourself. Unfortunately, we could not have the time to create the custom environment for today. Uh, if you guys want, if there is enough requests for it, we can always arrange another session to write a custom environment and take it from there. Or you can always reach out to me. Uh, you can reach out to my YouTube channel. I might make a video on it. And if, if you guys want, I can cover the rest of it and put it there. Uh, just let me know. Uh, we can actually always cover uh, the remaining parts of it. I'm actually moving on from Q learning to deep Q learning as well in near future. I might uh, extend this code and put it on my GitHub as an extension of Q learning to deep Q learning. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. Looks like it's still gonna take a little bit of time. So while it's running, I can show you a bit of custom environment, how to create a custom environment. I was planning to cover it today, but we don't have enough time. I will just finish in maybe 15 more minutes because I have another presentation after this today. So uh, what if you are not interested in games? We discussed open AI, gym environments. Those are all games or robotics control or some environments. For any reason, if one of those doesn't fit your needs, you can always write your own custom environments. How do you do that? Just remember the drill. Always, always remember the drill. For environment, you create an in a class called environment. For example, a transmitter receiver or a robotic arm or any, any kind of environment that you need for your research. You just create it as a Python class. You give it the attributes 
Some of the important attributes are action space and observation space. And remember, when you inherit from gym class, from gym environment, you can use action space and observation space from gym. In gym, I showed you spaces. I'm not sure if you remember here. These are different types of spaces that you can use to create your action space and observation space. So I think I'm using discrete or box or dictionary. Uh, my favorite ones are basically box, dictionary, discrete and multi discrete and multi binary. I haven't used these three. They're basically a combination of the others. But you can use these to basically create your action space and observation space box. I'm giving it zero and one as a binary option for my class. You create your action space, you create your observation space. My observation space in this particular case is just time. So it's a discrete uh, observation space. Then you can create your own reset function, which gives as output the initial state. You can create your own step function, which takes the action as input. And as output, it gives you O, R, done, and a dictionary for debugging. So you can write your own step function, and how you compute reward is entirely up to you. What reward you want to give for what action is what you're going to do here. And then you have the render function, which does nothing but print some statements. So that's all that you're going to need for a custom environment. I can do a detailed video on it later, and I can answer your questions there about it. Then you can write the same training loop that we just did that we are running right now on that environment and you can run it. Can you tell us how you're using this other technology in wireless communication research like any particular example where this is a, a use case? Well, I'm working on cognitive radio networks, which is a concept of for efficient utilization of radio spectrum. I'm basically trying to improve internet connectivity by using reinforcement learning. It has many use cases in wireless communication, in digital controls, in basically everything. Anything that you can convert into an environment and agent. I think Mansoor wants to say something. Yes, I think I got the uh, the question. It might be my question as well. Um, I think um, so. Let me see who was asking this question. Yeah, it was uh, Mohammed Ozer Khattak, if I'm not ruining his name. I think uh, he's more interested to know, like I said, it's my question as well. In a wireless communication with the cognitive radio concept, who is your agent and what is your action and what is the environment? Like it can be um, a notion with many problem statements, but for a basic Absolutely. cognitive radio, like you're sensing and transmitting or relaying in the same frequency resource, like what is your agent? What is your action? Well, in case of cognitive radio networks, the idea is that you have primary users of the radio spectrum and you have secondary users of the radio spectrum. So one IoT device, for example, your telephone can be the primary user of the bandwidth and another IoT device, for example, your coffee maker, which is Wi-Fi enabled, can be the secondary user of the radio spectrum. What I'm trying to do is efficiently utilizing the available radio spectrum in a way that even when you have a lot of devices trying to connect to your Wi-Fi, all of them get good connectivity. So the way I'm doing it is the radio spectrum is divided into licensed and unlicensed bands. So your coffee maker cannot by default access the licensed bands. Reinforcement learning can help the coffee maker see if the licensed spectrum is empty. If it's empty, it can take the action of accessing it. And if it's not empty, it can take the action of not accessing it at that time. So the action will be transmission or no transmission or delaying delayed transmission, holding off on transmitting based on if the spectrum is available or not right now so that it doesn't interfere with other devices. And what is the punishment uh, like? Uh, I mean, the opposite of the reward. 
negative rewards. Mm -hmm. Just like here we did rewards one and zero, your rewards can be plus one, zero, and minus one. Normally, negative rewards are used to encourage faster learning or energy consumption to manage the energy consumption. For example, you don't want your devices to always be participating in some process. So you associate some small negative cost, maybe minus 0 0.1 or minus 0 0.2 to discourage them from taking actions that don't lead to higher rewards. Yes, I get your point. Thank you. I think we have one more question. Um, if you're reading. Uh, do we have more than four states? Uh, absolutely, you can have as many states as you want. You can have as many states as you want. Your state space and action space is totally in your control. Please let me know if you have more questions. Uh, we can take maybe five to ten more minutes to answer some questions. Hopefully, by that time, we'll be able to show some accuracy plots. The training will be finished. Okay, let me expand the chat so that I can see the questions better. What is the research trend in this domain? Is it finding new applications using Aro or developing new and optimized environments and agents? Both. The researchers who are working in uh, purely RL theoretical domain, they are writing more agents, they are writing more algorithms. The people who are working more on the application side are applying those existing algorithms to wireless communication, to controls, to marine biology, to basically whatever field they're working in, because applying existing RL algorithms to a specific field itself is a huge field right now because it's so new and it's really efficient it's it has proven to be so to work so well in all the decision making processes in rl related domains that the application of it to other domains is relatively still a new and very exciting field can i ask one more question absolutely absolutely go ahead yeah this could be a question uh, from other fellows here so let's say what some people are working in deep learning or federated learning, even though I know that the federated learning is a quite different discipline. So it's about like distributing the learning. So yes. it can be like a mix of federated deep reinforcement learning. It can be any mix of this, but how this like uh, for, for the, for the deep learning guys, how we can make a fair judgment or a fair comparison that we could say, okay, reinforcement learning is performing much better than the deep learning. So the first cost of the deep learning is needing data set. So when you do not have any data set, of course, reinforcement learning is much better. But imagine that you have data set for the deep learning as well. Now you are interested to compare which one is much better, reinforcement learning or deep learning. Is this comparison fair at all, or it's something like irrelevant and out of scope? I would say a better question would be what's more suitable in what particular setting? When you have a lot of labeled data and your application isn't changing on runtime, definitely go for deep learning. When you have uh, an application which requires learning through interaction with the environment and learning from getting rewards from the environment, go for reinforcement learning. So the question of which one is better is kind of not as meaningful as asking which one is more relevant for which particular setting. Okay, depending on the application like this. So it's not a fair, fair job to compare like a, a, a runner with swimmer. <laughs> exactly, like exactly. This. Exactly, okay. exactly. Okay, perfect. Do we have one more question? Okay. Uh, um, can we use RL for human activity recognition with initial sensor data? If so, what can be the environment and agent? Uh, depends what kind of human activity recognition you want to do. If you want to do some handwritten uh, or hand gestures, or if you want to 
like what depends on your objective is your if your objective is to learn what po postures correspond to what thing i think deep learning might be a better idea to go since your uh, postures might be approximately the same or you might already have a set of postures that you're going to deal with but if you're expecting to learn some new postures and you want to know what exactly uh, should be the best thing in what posture for example if a person is about to fall and you want to teach that uh, a robot that if a person is about to fall then the best action is to put your hand down on the ground something like that then your action space can be the movements of different body parts and it, it can be a, in the form of a dictionary you can have hand forward backward up down legs at this angle at this speed so you can define your action space in terms of the actions or movements of the body parts that you're controlling and you can basically uh, teach the agent it's it's a lot similar to the robotics control or robotics walk or movement process that we saw in open ai gym environments when the agents have multiple arms and they're trying to learn how to walk or how to balance themselves so i would encourage you to explore more on those type of environments because they're a lot similar to your application i see we have more questions uh, yeah more questions from <laughs> In person, uh, Mohammed is uh, very eager, like uh, to to ask many questions. So it's okay. Uh, <laughs> which means like that there is somebody who, who got the, like in most of this event. Uh, <laughs> Does RL also depend on huge computation resources to update its Qtable, or are Qtables a large compute? Comparable numbers for learning the cycle of deep neural networks. Well, uh, it depends on your state space. For small state spaces, for example, like uh, if you want to just write a wireless communication environment where there is one transmitter, one receiver, so you have only two dimensional Qtable with very small size, it's much, much, much less computationally intensive. You can train it in maybe a couple of minutes. It won't even take uh, as long as this environment that that we put on 10,000 episodes and we are rendering it every 100 episodes. So it would take very minimal resources in those cases. But as your state spaces and action spaces start growing to multiple actions, multiple states, then it would start taking more resources. Okay, what's what's next? Mansoor, can you help me with the questions? I think there are so yes, many I think it's a better idea. I think it's a better idea to 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 stop your sharing, like uh, people can see you and. Uh, All I mean, right. Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, so can you give a little idea about the? Okay, got it. So the other question is, uh, yes, I mean. The, the reinforcement learning is quite different paradigm and uh, it's um, it has been shown that it is much efficient than other learning techniques depending on the situation that you do not have any idea about the statistics so this this workshop like uh, was a very good introduction for those that are really interested to pursue their studies their research or start working on it and i appreciate sadia who gave us a very informative workshop very very constructive and we get a lot of endorsements in the chat box i see and uh, we are still live on facebook so officially the the, the time is already finished so <laughs> like um so everybody if 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 you need to leave so like you are free to go <laughs>